This conference will now be recorded. Okay, um, welcome. Today is Tuesday, January, um, October, um, October 27th. <laughs> Today we have a planning, zoning, public hearing, and general meeting with time permitting. Um, we are in room 219 at Town Hall, and we're also doing this meeting virtually via go-to meeting. Um, let's get right into it. Um, Kara Gately is in transit on her way here. Um, it should be here shortly. Uh, tonight, first item on the agenda is continuation of the public hearing regarding proposed amendments to the Darien Zoning Regulations, COZR number 4-2020, business pl site plan application number 128B as in boy, uh, special permit application number 314, 711, Inc. 306 Road. Uh, as a quick reminder, this is the um, currently it's the Duchess Drive uh, Drive Through Restaurant that is on the Post Road near the intersection of Exit 13 of Interstate 95. We had this hearing once already um, a couple weeks ago. Um, the applicant made a presentation. We had some follow up and more stuff to go through. So, Jeremy, what are we going to talk about tonight? Sure. In your in the PD packets, since the last public hearing, we have a October 19th report from Joe Canis, our peer reviewer on stormwater and drainage. He works for Tie and Bond. In your packets and also on the town website at www.darianct.gov backslash PZC pending applications, where we posted all the application materials. It includes a cover letter from Amy Sushins, the attorney on behalf of the applicant, which notes that she has also submitted an October 22nd letter from McMahon Associates, responding to peer reviewer Michael Galante's comments on traffic and parking. She submitted a aerial depicting distance to adjacent commercial properties, some revised site plans, and some updated information on signs. Tonight, I think Amy's going to focus in a couple areas uh, in terms of the proposed zoning regulations. We'll talk about changes to the site plan. She'll so have uh, Jason talk about traffic and parking, and we'll have time for the public to speak as well. And if we don't, it's likely we won't get through everything tonight. There'll be a subsequent public hearing. You know. Okay. Um, Who's speaking? Amy's going to speak first. One second, Amy. Just say for Joe Canis and Ken Kronberg. Do you mind putting your um, microphones on mute or something on mute until um, Amy, until it's your turn to speak? Uh, Joe, you're uh, perfect. Got it. Um, turn up to Amy, right? Yes. Amy um, Soshin, if that's how you pronounce your name properly. I apologize. Welcome to the meeting again. Um, the floor is yours. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Amy Sutins, attorney at Herwood Sager and Salzburg, and not with offices in Milford, here representing uh, 7 Eleven. Um, I will tell you, looking at the screen, we have pretty much half the meeting is probably uh, representatives um, or someone on our team um, that will address uh, a number of the issues here, whether it's um, an affirmative presentation or uh, in response to any questions. But uh, as Jeremy noted, we wanted to give you sort of an update on where we've been, uh, what we think has been resolved, and uh, what we still have outstanding. So with that, um, just by way of update, since we were before you on September 22nd, uh, we were before the ZBA on our uh, location approval, which is the state licensing requirement, um, and our variance application, which relates to signage. Um, the ZBA was particularly interested in a number of, frankly, the same questions that you had about traffic at the September 22nd uh, meeting, given that, um, as outlined in the McMahon letter we shared with you, uh, a number of the um, components, specifically including the Birch Road intersection counts that you had requested, um, remain outstanding. Uh, Jason can address it in more detail if you'd like to hear from him. Um, but basically, we've we've gotten those counts, but they need to be. Um, uh, we're waiting for DOT comments because of the um, pandemic and an understanding that those counts aren't necessarily accurate. 
uh, to, to normal conditions. So that's what we're waiting for. Um, and as a result of that, uh, our ZBA hearing has been continued to the um, November 18th meeting. And we do expect that um, at the ZBA's request um, and a request that we shared actually, uh, that Mr. Galante will be able to attend that meeting and address any of the, frankly, same questions that, that you had for, for him. Um, and then also uh, with respect to the ZBA, we have the pending variance application with, which relates to our signage. Uh, as you saw in our materials that we submitted, uh, the pylon sign has been updated to reflect a monument uh, sign design. Uh, it would go in the exact same location as the uh, proposed pylon, but we still do need a variance because of the um, square footage proposed and the location of the fuel price portion of the sign closer to the street than the uh, fuel canopy, which is generally the requirement in your regulations. So those are the two issues that we are um, addressing with the ZBA on the 18th. And then we were also before the ARB last week. Uh, we're continuing to work with them and try to incorporate some of their comments on the design issues related to both mm -hmm. the building and the uh, canopy. Mm -hmm. As you might imagine, we're addressing uh, a variety of issues, not only in front of them, but um, internally too, in trying to resolve some of the other comments and um, items that have been raised, including uh, the comments from the adjacent property owner, Nick Fletcher, with a request to make modifications to, to minimize any impact on uh, the tenants in his building. Um, and so we haven't presented any updated uh, architectural plans to you as a result uh, of that ongoing process with the um, ARB, but we do, much like the ZBA, expect that um, you know, by the time we get to your next meeting, which I understand to be on um, November 10th, we will be able to give you um, a bit more feedback as to uh, those two items. Um, and the other thing is the um, monument sign is also before the ARB, um, obviously, and they are looking for feedback from the uh, ZBA as to where they're headed with the variants before they weigh in the sign. So we're um, working through everybody's um, uh, comments. So then with respect to the um, issues that are sort of squarely before you and where we left off at the last meeting, um, before I turn it over to um, Jim Bernardino, there were also a couple of uh, items that I wanted to run through, uh, as Jeremy noted, in particular, uh, the regulation amendment that we have um, proposed. Um, does reflect sort of a modern uh, modern approach to your um, semi-outdated regulations. They haven't been updated in um, uh, quite a long time. And so the comprehensive reg that we've uh, worked with your staff to draft was intended to uh, modernize the regulations, uh, bring it into sort of a 21st century approach to gasoline versus repair shops. Um, and unlike um, there was one of the comments um, made uh, by Mr. Oben, who was uh, submitted a letter um, opposing the application, uh, should be in your package. Um, this regulation, I just want to be clear, is intended to be uh, and is town-wide, so it's not designed specifically to um, only benefit 7-Eleven. It updates the regulations to reflect things like full serve versus self serve or whether you need to have uh, a, a storage capacity for towed vehicles if you're just running a gas station so i think the idea of the regulation is to um, clarify and update it and uh, as i said would be something that's beneficial to all of the uh, gas station owners or anybody else that might be might be coming into into town so there really weren't too many questions at the last hearing about the regulation, but I think that was the first um, and major item that um, I wanted to find out if there was any other feedback or questions about the, um, the draft that we had provided or um, any other comments. Um, thank you, Amy. Before you uh, 
move on to your first um, expert. With yes. regards to the traffic count and the traffic take, Michael County, I understand, is not here. Today. He submitted a letter. He did submit a letter. It should be. I have it. Yeah, yep. I saw it. I didn't read it word for word. I and then McMahon also submitted a response letter dated October 22nd. Uh, but basically, what Amy mentioned earlier is they're waiting for the traffic counts. That's to what submit. I'm going to get to that. Now, relative to the traffic counts, I mean, I, it's we can sit there and argue if COVID's over or COVID's not over, and if we're back to normal, not back to normal. I can tell you that I got stuck in traffic post road near your intersection last week. The question is, are you doing hard counts and putting those rubber things in the road in the week da -da 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 over it for three days, or are you just taking some stuff off a website from the you know national database that's dated you know a couple of years back? Um, let me turn it over to, to Jason to answer that question. Um, I think the important part was he and Mr. Galante uh, coordinated about how they should approach the Birch Road intersections. Um, so with that, I'll, Jason, somewhere on my screen, um, I'll yes. turn it over to him to, to answer. Okay, good evening. Michael, come, um, hold on one second. Michael's not here to, to answer that, but that's okay, because I'll, I trust Jason too. And then with regard to the new monument side, that's not going to be the 20 foot T temporary sign that you had up two weekends ago that whole deep that idea has been scrapped that has been scrapped um in in response to the the request the, frankly very strong request from the from the zba and the arb to try and switch to a monument sign that was it, i was part of that request also so now is this the latest and greatest for that that is that is the latest the plan that we submitted is the latest and greatest it would go um in the same proposed location as the pylon sign and just so it's clear on the record what we discovered um in connection with the um installation of that mock pylon sign pylon sample is actually, uh, That's uh, uh, thank you sir caller number three your mic can also if you could also mute your microphone that would be great too i'm sorry amy go ahead That's okay. um so that when the installers went to um put the sign in the ground because of the um uh size of the sign and what it needed to, you know there was going to be some expected winds and weather issues um they hit rock and some sort right, of right yeah no, I, heard, I heard i heard so all about it, that but that, that doesn't it, matter because that well, idea was scrapped Right, it's it's actually about uh, I think it was about five to six feet further back than the proposed I get it. location. I got it. That's fine. I'm just trying to see when are we going to get the the final of this. That is so. That is the final of the. I'm looking the angle because you're on that side of my screen. Sorry. Um, so that is the final version of that sign. It is going in the exact same location as the pylon on the site plan. And, and, and so this is five feet. Look like. I got it. So it's five feet high and it's seven, nine feet, seven inches wide. You need a variance to this because of the size or the location or both? Uh, both. So the location of the fuel price portion of the sign. So we could have the 7 Eleven and the roost. That does not require a variance as the monument sign. Because the fuel price is located on the sign. Under your sign regulations, a fuel price sign cannot be located any closer to the street than the canopy. And so if you were to apply that to this site, and the reason we're asking and believe we have a hardship is that that would put this monument sign or a pylon sign approximately 45 feet back from the street in order to be um, uh, parallel with the uh, canopy. So the fuel price portion of the sign needs the variance and then the square footage of both the fuel price and the 7-eleven and roof signs also require variance the monuments a little bit uh, allows us 20 square feet um, of signage for the roost and 7-eleven we're asking for 30 and the fuel price sign um, is allowed to be 12 square feet and we're asking for 17. And you know, we worked on these signage regulations for, for a year to make them to, to change them from what they used to be. We we understand that, and that is frankly one of the reasons that we did not ask for any amendments to the signage requirements um, in our draft 
regulation because we, we were very aware of the fact that um, you had spent a great deal of time um, and a great deal of publicity about the changes to your to your sign regulations and staff was um, you know pretty clear with us. Now that Agreed. said, we it still we doesn't work for you. What? And it still doesn't work for you. Uh, right. Because be, and frankly, I think for exactly the reasons that we're looking for the variance because of the the location of the property with the limitations along 95 and um, how the this actually the taking of the front part of the property. Okay, so, that's right. Um, I just sure you know that we worked on our Senate regulations to revise them for a solid year. Yes, we are aware. Um, all right, moving on. Um, I didn't you, miss anything. You wanted Jason uh, from McMahon Associates to speak? Yeah, whoever, whoever is Jason Adams. Go ahead, Jason, take it away, sir. Yes, uh, good evening, Jason Adams from McMahon Associates. Uh, and just to speak to your question about the data collection on Birch Road. Uh, we had a technician in the field uh, two weeks ago during the weekday morning peak period, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., and the weekday afternoon peak period, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. So they are card counts, um, peak period counts, and we are, as Attorney Suchin said, working with Connecticut Department of Transportation right now to, to review that data um, to understand what uh, adjustments they'd like us to make so that we can all be comfortable with the data representing as normal a traffic condition as possible. So you did take your own private hard counts? We did, and yes. Want, and you want to review those with the state? Yes, because it's it's still an abnormal time overall. Uh, so in order to, okay. to get a clean data set, we, we likely will apply an adjustment factor. Okay. As long as Michael Galante and you guys are on the same page. Yes. Yeah, you're we, the expert. We, 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 uh, can, can I ask, are you? Also, are you counting the traffic on Birch Road trying to get onto Route 1 as part of those counts? Yes, yes. So, so Post Road and, and Birch Road, yes. Mm -hmm. And that would also include wait times on Birch Road for people trying to, to turn? Yeah, we, we will have that information as well, yes. Okay, great. So it's great. Good. It's got the with queuing back it up on, on Birch Road, all that good stuff. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I'll be transparent. Birch Road is very difficult to get onto Route 1 right now. So if traffic is going to be up, you were talking about 190 cars, if that's going to be a significant issue, I want to know about it. Yeah, we, we will document all of that and present it back to uh, to the to the town and, and to the peer reviewer, um, as well as the responses to the original peer review questions will be one succinct um, submittal. All right, so we're going to, to Amy, just in terms of process and um, yeah. and uh, batting order, we're going to kind of sort of delay that until November right. 10th, right? And that was, that was what uh, Mr. Ginsburg and I had talked about earlier, um, or late last week, that we need to give you an update tonight but but likely resolve that and that's we understood that mr galante would not be here to participate because we like that more sort of fulsome discussion on the 10th okay so moving on to your next expert is that right yep um, just okay. so i can wrap up on the first part was there anything um we wanted anybody on the commission wanted to discuss with respect to the um regulation amendment I'm good. Care. So, I mean, you speak about that, you know, get up to the 21st century and that we're behind like, you know, 100 years or something. But we do have other gas stations in town that have convenience stores and don't have auto repair shops. So how do you reconcile that with your representations in your application and today on the record? Um, frankly, we've been puzzled by that too, because under your current regulations, um, I don't know whether some of them had convenience stores and predated, you know, your your regulations by thirty some odd years. Um, but but certainly there are um, there is there is no question that there are locations that are non-conforming with your regulations right now. And adopting the regulation would actually bring those into conformity, um, and and that's that's maybe probably the biggest benefit to the other 
gas stations oh. in town. I don't know about that. Um, you know, relative to that, Karen, the only thing I can tell you, especially the standard oil, that was an existing gas station where the bays were converted to a convenience. I didn't pull the application. Maybe Jeremy wants to. One, I mean, that analysis should be done because representations are being made on the record that, you know, we need to get ready for the 21st century. But it appears that yeah, okay. our gas stations in town, I mean, we have a number of gas stations in town that have convenience stores. You know, we don't have dude and bug, you know, we don't have horse and buggies running around here. We are in the 21st century. And so, I mean, to make these representations that just factually aren't true is a big trouble. It's me. I, I like, disagree that they're untrue um, because I have gas stations in town, correct, that have convenience stores. They, they Thank do. You. Okay, great. Then it's not untrue. What I said is not untrue. No, I, I'm, okay. I'm simply saying that if, if you thought I was mis misrepresenting something, I'd like to correct that because I take my reputation quite strongly. Um, and so what you're asking is sort of documentation as to how those stations were approved. I'm happy to get that for you. I can get that, but I asked whether we had gas stations in town that did not have repair shops that had convenience stores. There, there are certainly some, and I do not know how or why they were approved because they are not, but the sh long and short of it is regardless of how that happened, they are non-conforming with your current regulation. And so to make them conforming opens up a whole host of options for those owners. Right now, if the property were destroyed as non-conforming, they'd have very limited abilities to repair, et cetera, fix. So eliminating non-conformities is, a primary goal of zoning, and I think that's one of the things the regulation does. Yeah, we can we can look into that. We'll have Jeremy look into that, Kara. I I hundred percent get your point. Yeah. I hundred percent get your point. Okay. And on the sign issue, uh, but you know what? I won't even bring sign it. I'll let ZBA talk. You know, discuss whether who you know the hardship issue and you know whether the the standard is met. That's not our issue. That's theirs. Right, relative to the heart. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, does any other commissioner have any questions on their proposed amendment to the zoning code? Uh, George Riley, uh, I think we're good. Okay. That's really your expertise, Amy, also. Um, so, we're, we understand where you are on that. Um, and we can move on to the next item. Okay. okay. Yes. And then the um, other item that I wanted to address before we turn over to um, what I would say are more technical comments uh, was that we understood that there was a question raised um, by one of the commission members about um, my comment at the last hearing that um, we would not be able to sell beer um, on the property and whether um, sort of why we weren't eligible for a grocery beer permit under Connecticut law. Um, so just by way of background, um, I think as everybody knows, there are different types of um, uh, liquor permitting in Connecticut. Uh, grocery stores are defined under uh, Connecticut General Statutes 30-20, um, and they are stores commonly known as supermarket, food store, grocery store, deli, et cetera, and goes on to say, you know, primarily engaged in retail sales. And the way the Department of Consumer Protection um, looks at that in the licensing requirements is to, um, and if I could just share my screen. They, um, continuing the thought, um, what they do in assessing whether or not you meet the definition of a grocery store um, is to look, frankly, at your sales. Um, and so, sorry, I'm looking at the screen sharing. Great, thanks. Um, so this is the requirement that, or excuse me, the form that is required if you were eligible for a grocery store beer permit or wanted to apply. And as you can see here, 
There's a variety of categories, the first, frankly, six of which are what the Department of Consumer Protection and Liquor Control think of as sort of true grocery items. And then items seven through 12, and 12 is beer if you have an active permit, um, are the things that the uh, department sort of disqualifies as grocery items. So unless your um, grocery total, basically columns, items one through six, are more than 50% of your sales as compared to items seven through 12, you're ineligible for a grocery beer permit. So as you can see here, if our number 11 is gasoline, number uh, eight, nine, 10 are all of the um, non-edible takeout items like tobacco, magazines, et cetera, and all the takeout food. So if you think about um, if you've ever been into pretty much not even a 7-Eleven, but um, a Cumberland Farms, a Wheels, any of the other uh, gas stations or most convenience stores, you can see that um, it's highly unlikely that the sort of true grocery items are going to exceed um, those require those non-grocery items. And so as a result, you become ineligible for a grocery beer permit under under Connecticut law. So, so the was. bottom line is is you're not asking for alcohol beer sales. Correct. Nor right? could we nor could we obtain it. Okay. So we can still put in the resolution that no alcohol will be sold on the property. Correct. And if you ever want to change that for some reason, you got to come back to the commission in right. you know, 2025. Right. It, it, would, it would require an amendment to the liquor regulations and then a return to you if we want to. Okay. That's right. Got it. But just, we'll just put it in the resolution that um, any proposed resolution that there's no alcohol sales. Mm -hmm. Great. Makes it easy. Takes it Great. Okay. Um, and with that, um, I'll turn it over to, to Jim, uh, who will walk you through um, all of the sort of what I would call technical changes that we have made uh, since your meeting in response to uh, Mr. Canis's comments, a couple from Mr. Galante, DOT, et cetera. So with that, Jim. This is gonna be like parking space. Yep. Thank you, Amy. Uh, for the record, Jim Bernardino, uh, project manager uh, with Bowler Engineering, uh, with the civil site engineers for the project. Um, in, in your package that was uh, part of the resubmission, we included an aerial exhibit uh, during the last um, meeting that we were at, it was requested that we, we take a closer look at uh, the surrounding neighborhood and potential impacts that the site may have um, to those areas. Uh, obviously, um, we do have our traffic consultant, Jason Adams, that spoke, spoke previously. He, he's looking at traffic impacts that will be associated uh, with the development at the intersection of, of Birch and uh, Boston Post Road. So um, that evaluation is still undergoing. Uh, we prepared the exhibit that was in your package just to give the, the uh, commission a feel for what's around in the neighborhood, uh, the zoning districts that are uh, directly adjacent to the property uh, and the locations of the residential neighborhoods in relations to the existing uh, commercial uses you know, within the uh, business zones. Now, um, we've uh, prepared just a, um, a a typical aerial exhibit. We showed a 500 foot radius, which is just a, a an arbitrary number that was um, put on the plan just to give an idea of sense of scale when you look at the overall project. Um, in, in looking at that, our site uh, is sited uh, about 250 feet within the um, business district. And obviously, which is would be an offset from the uh, single family or the one family residential district located to the east of the project. Um, with that 500 foot radius, we know about approximately seven residential homes are within that 500 foot buffer or the 500 foot offset uh, to our subject property. Um, I think four or five of those residential homes that are within that 500 foot radius are directly adjacent to existing, existing business or commercial uses 
within Boston Post Road. Um, so in taking a look at uh, the location of our site, the impacts such as noise, traffic, lighting, uh, things of that nature, uh, we feel that the uh, separation to the residential zones, you know, being over 250 feet away to the residential zone and being separated to that zone with Boston Post Road, as well as other commercial retail businesses. Um, we believe that the site has been uh, cited accordingly and appropriately to minimize any impact to the residential areas. Uh, obviously, we're still looking at the traffic uh, component of it, as uh, Mr. Adams was mentioning previously. So that's going to be um, continued evaluation with the repair reviewer. Uh, as far as site plan regulations, um, in, as far as site plan modifications uh, um, that have happened since the uh, last uh, hearing that we had, uh, we've updated the landscaping plan. We modified the shade tree species along the front so that we have multiple um, species along the front. We have no two um, particular tree species side by side. So we introduced a little leaf linden shade tree along the front, staggered with uh, a pear tree as well. Um, in addition, we've increased the size of the um, proposed plant, uh, tree at planting. The original proposal was a two and a half to three inch um, diameter um, tree at planting. We've increased that to three to three and a half inches. Um, we've increased that, you know, twofold, one under the um, request or uh, of of the commission or at least particular commissioners and we've also spoken with our landscape architects on our team to find out you know suitable sizes for these plantings that come in um three to three and a half inch diameter trees as currently specified is a, a available size with nurseries generally you would have to go to a reputable nursery to get something of uh, that caliber um so with that um we feel that it's readily available and also when planting uh, it was you know i was educated from our landscape uh, architects that generally it takes a, a tree once planted from the nursery one year for each inch diameter so the larger you get a a tree the longer it takes to get established and become a healthy vibrant uh, planting so uh, with that, uh, our landscape uh, architects did recommend a three to a three and a half inch uh, caliper tree, which is currently on the, um, in the proposal on the revised site plans. Um, we did uh, take the recommendation from uh, the commission. We removed the first parking spot as you entered the site on the right hand side, directly head into the building. Um, we removed that one spot, giving the access drive that much more um, length to pull into the site and have uh, appropriate circulation throughout without concern of conflict of larger vehicles maybe sticking out at the end of the parking stall or just some backup movement. Uh, that did reduce the overall parking by one, 24 are proposed. Uh, we're still within the limitations of the proposed uh, required minimum parking for the site. Um, We've also received the tie-in bond technical letter. Um, I did correspond with Joe. Uh, we provided a comprehensive revised set of site plans. Um, that comment letter was mostly technical in nature. Um, it'll be very difficult to find a modification to the site plan. There were very um, minor alterations to um, pipe size alignments and the like. I won't get into a bullet by bullet list, but they were more technical in nature uh, as it related to subsurface drainage and the like. We've also updated part, uh, drainage calculations and construction details. Um, so fundamentally, the site plan didn't change. You, you didn't see larger impervious areas. Our drainage basins didn't get larger. Um, so there was no substantial site plan changes as it relates to the overall function um, of the development. Uh, we have received the subsequent memo um, 
from Ty and Bond as well. Um, the majority of the comments have been addressed. There are a small handful of um, comments that remain and a new comment as well. Um, those, we've reviewed those and the applicant's gonna make, take no exception to addressing those uh, with the pair reviewer. Um, they were very minor in nature, in my opinion. Uh, there are some updates to some watershed maps for the technical aspect of it in the drain report, which will require no modification to the site plans. Uh, there's also um, a couple comments regarding erosion sediment control, which is just adding a little bit more detail and a calculation for some of the erosion control practices that are going to be implemented on the site. Again, more construction related does not necessarily affect the overall um, development of this, the site. There was uh, one additional comment that was noted, which was um, a comment regarding our drainage. We're actually doing a little bit of work on the north side of the property where uh, we've been requested by DOT to pull the drain line back onto our property. Presently, the drain line discharges directly into their uh, their property within uh, just off on the south side of the on-ramp uh, to the highway, the interstate. And that was requested that we take that uh, discharge, pull it back into our site and stabilize the uh, channel you know, between the proposed discharge location and the existing. So there is some work there. Um, Joe did mention that it's through across the non-access line. However, this request has been um, request, was requested by the DOT uh, during their uh, preliminary review of our plans. Um, that kind of leads me into the next set of comments that we did receive, which was from DOT. There was a handful of very minor. Um, can I can I interrupt one second, James? Just I want to make sure that we get certain things on the record, make sure we're right. Um, going back to the trees, right? You're yes. doing three inch caliber trees. At the end of the day, you're only putting four trees on the front of the property. That's correct. Three to the left side, one to the right side, blocking the building, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, with regard to the one that is is in front of the building, it, these going to be deciduous trees that are the canopy is is six feet up in the air probably. That's correct. Like that. Right. So the sign, I think there's supposed to be a sign on that facade that says 7-Eleven. Is that tree going to block that sign? Um, I would say yes. I, I'm not sure of what the characteristics of the signage on if it is it's, i think believe it's just a 7-eleven emblem so at the right. end of the day there is there will be some screening you know during the you know summertime months um of the building facade yes right so that's that's my point if we're if we're getting a you know need to have more signs in the building you have a tree blocking the sign what's the use of the sign that's where they cut did it kind of go hand in hand right? well Obviously, I, mean, you, I get it. It's not your bailiwick, but that's where the things are kind of related. I understood the comment. Um, you know, these are deciduous trees, um, and there are sight lines between the trees as you do travel. Um, is it 100% obscured? No, it won't be. If you're standing directly in front of the building across the street, yes. Um, but as you do travel up and down um, Boston Pearls Road, it will be visible through some of those corridors between the proposed trees uh, as you do travel. Okay, then the second item is um, for you at this juncture, right now we have 22, um, I'm sorry, 24 parking spaces and the yeah. requirement is 22. I just wanna make sure all the commissioners get that. It, there's no issue relative to parking. They're required to have 22 and they have 24. On the same page? Say yes, Jim. Yes. Okay, great. Relative okay. to that, relative to that, and this goes back to a question I brought up the last time. You you have one, two, three, four parking spaces locking the entrance to the dumpsters. Yes. Okay. And you have one, two, three, four, uh, about six parking spaces next to the oil fuel tanks. Okay, yes, where yes. The, fill, the fill tanks are. 
So with that said, at the last meeting, and maybe this is where Amy comes in, relative to operations, I'd, I'd like to understand delivery times, because if you're blocking 10 parking spaces, and I brought this up last time at 12 noon, because you're delivering gas to those tanks, we're gonna have an issue in the same breath if you're delivering Coke and Pepsi and to be to be fair and and um, Lay's potato chips and you're using where the dumpsters are as your as your loading dock, you know, you're also just blocked for parking space. So I don't know where you're gonna weave this in, but part of the thing that's gonna be important to us is um, is delivery times for fuel and operations in the building. When that when we did the whole food foods application years ago. We made them only go one way and delivery times are very set. We do that in a lot of applications because we don't want, you know, you know, eight or 10, it could be possibly if you have the dumpsters coming, the, the, the people dropping off the soda and the coffee at the same exact time that the guys come in with the, you know, with the fuel, you just lost yourself 14 parking spaces. Right, so I can address, I was actually gonna do that at the end of Jim's presentation, but I think now seems like it makes sense. Um, with respect to deliveries, because that was one of the questions. Um, <clears throat> there are um, tractor trailers, the, the larger vehicles that come onto the site, um, approximately um, once to twice a week, they are on site for approximately 30 minutes. So we're talking about an hour over the course of the week um, for those, uh, for that larger truck. And then there are that, smaller- is that, is that the fuel truck? Or is that the truck that's bringing in coffee and and no, soda that's, and that's the larger fuel um, fuel style truck. The um, other items, you know, Frito Lay, Coke, those kinds of things. Um, yep. There are a couple of uh, those are delivered by box truck. Um, they are uh, pretty much um, once again, same thing. Um, occasional during the week, one to two times. Um, and there are uh, specific deliveries for um, certain vendors, Coke, Pepsi, Frito-Lay, and then 7-Eleven has a corporate, um, you know, basically stock corporate type um, delivery of everything else in the store. Um, those are also delivered uh, via box truck. Um, very, again, sort of short window, uh, approximately, uh, same thing, about 30 minutes or so uh, for for those operations. So we're so, looking. Uh, are we going to be able to are we going to be able to button down those times, the days of the week, or or you know times of the day? When I go to my gas station, the the, the fuel truck is always there on Sunday nights, I see. and nobody's around except for me. I, I mean, yeah. I don't know, but I, I mean, you guys have a, a bazillion 7-Elevens across the country. You know, I'm sure you know how many deliveries have to go there. I'm just yep. trying to make sure it's not between, you know, 6 a.m. in the morning when everyone's there getting gas before work or, you know, some other busy time. That's all I'm trying to get at because it, it oh. relates to parking and relates to the layout of the site. It relates to, you know, Jim, Jim Berardino says the site works great for the way it's designed. I just want to make sure. And it works. But you didn't state how many the corporate delivery box type truck that 7-Eleven sends. You stated that the other trucks would be once or twice a week for about 30 minutes. You never stated the, the amount of the frequency, only the duration of those 7-Eleven deliveries of everything else. So would that also be once or twice a week or anticipated to be more? Uh, no, that's that's about right. We're, we're expecting, um, you know, on average, it's 10 to 11 deliveries via box truck over the course of a week. So it's at least one a day. At least one a day, some days two. If you don't deliver on Sundays, then you're dividing 12 by six. So it's two a day. Something like that. We don't we don't need to nail it down right now, but that right. it's relates to, to the amount of parking and truck parking and, and delivery yeah. times. I want right. to make sure it's the same page. Right. I'm not, obviously we want to make sure that we're not creating issues, you know, operational issues on the site either, because we don't want to have um you know vehicle deliveries or fuel deliveries whatever it is coming at a time when we know 
that the um, you know it's it's a peak out for us. So that's that's certainly a operational question that the operational concern we would have. One hundred percent agree. I mean, when we did we do car dealerships in town. We don't let the car dealerships drop off cars while they're parked in the post road. It's got to be on site. So the guy had to redo his thing for where uh, what's down there where Land Rover and and um, Jaguar are. They had to redo their site plan because they couldn't get their truck on the site. Right. I oh, want to make sure that, that you know where we stand and that you guys have figured this at all. Because the last thing I want to do is see a 7-Eleven truck parked on the post road and some guy with with a with a hand truck taking cases of coke back and forth. Yeah. No. And and that was actually one of the questions um, that that um, and, and it's in our site plan. It does have the truck uh, turning movement to show that that. You know, it's able to um, the the tractor trailer is able to uh, maneuver on the site around the pumps. Um, and again, you're, you're, yeah, you're talking about fuel again. I'm not worried about fuel. I'm worried about the guy delivering the coke. Right. No, and and obviously we want that happening on site as well. That's fine. As long as we're on the same page, that's fine. Yeah. Dave. Yes, Jim. Just to you mentioned uh, when you were clarifying the parking. Yep. Uh, they're they're allowed 26 and they've got 24 or whatever the number it, it's tw required is 22 with all these spaces that are that you know could potentially be blocked and they're providing 24 so they have two extra okay. is that in the context of the exit the rules as they stand today or the uh does that take account of the amendments that are being proposed it's the rules that stand today on our parking where it's it's fuel, gas, and restaurant use based upon a percentage of the building. Sorry. Yeah. No, the twenty the twenty two is the right number. And they're giving us twenty four. But my problem is that if they blocking four of them because they're gonna have a delivery truck blocking the two dumpsters on the top end, they don't have twenty two. I mean they don't have twenty four, they only have twenty. Right, because there's no there's no truck loading spot. I apologize for interrupting, um, but that's yeah, fine. That's really good point, because also, are they going right. to anticipate doing like what Starbucks does, which is to prevent blocking of dumpsters and blocking of different areas? They keep the dumpster door open to prevent cars from going to certain spots. And that's precisely the same kind of concept, right? Because there's no dedicated delivery zone, parking and delivery trucks are in competition and cars blocking dumpster access becomes an issue. And you'll notice at Starbucks, there's a self-help sort of solution that they've come up with, which is they keep the doors to block sure. the dumpster open all the time. Right, and I, I think that's Right. No, that is that is certainly not the intention to have those. But your design sort of in, invites it. Well, but I think it's, I think those, it's those four spaces. If I if I had a box truck that comes at twelve noon to drop off coke and they take those four oh, spaces, you know, Vanny can't park there. Like where are those trucks gonna go? Or else I'm or else I'm blocking in the box truck. You know what I'm saying, Amy? Yeah, it, but I think it looks, that it looks back there. Like you, it looks back there. I apologize for interrupting. Um, right. No, no, that's, that's okay. So I think there's there's that's two things. One, um, from a internal 7-Eleven perspective, um, and what we expect for operations on the site, we actually think we have more than sufficient parking for the number of customers that we expect to come into the site and the average duration. So the average duration of a customer um, coming in onto the site is approximately three minutes. You come in. Right, you, but you still, regardless of what you're saying, you still need 22 spaces. Correct. And, and our right, point is, is that it's unlikely that all 20, based on our customer expectations, it's unlikely you would ever reach the point where we're getting even close to capacity on the parking spaces. Um, and that's why even providing additional action, you know, additional beyond that um, accounts for that. I mean, you also have to remember what we've done in the regulation is account for the um, restaurant portion of the use um, as, as restaurant 
And the other point that we have not, um, you know, we touched on last time and we made a specific point not to include in the regulations because you have not, the spaces at the pumps are not included in the count. So theoretically, somebody who's coming into the site and just getting gas and leaving um, is not taking up one of those parking spaces. So historically, Dairy Ann has not counted those spaces at the pump. It was a conversation we had with staff early on. Their recommendation was not to do that. If you were to include those, you're not looking sure. at approximately 38 spaces. Not, but we're not going to do that. So we have we're, not gonna do that. we're not going to do that, so it doesn't matter anyway. Yeah. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, we're not we're not we're not counting those other spaces at the That's at the 12 right. islands we're not counting them for zoning purposes but practically speaking some people coming to the site may be using the pump I, I, and never going anywhere else i got yeah. it if i just like to add as well obviously you know the concern if those parking spaces are blocking the loading zone or the dumpster enclosure um with the single unit trucks there's ability and staging area when they pull into the site, they would typically go across the front of the building, turn left in their staging area, you know, but you know, in the drive aisle between the pumps and the edge of curb, where you could actually pull in the, the truck and wait for the customers to leave. As Amy mentioned, the average customer is only two to three minutes. So there's area for that truck to stage for two to three minute time while that customer has time to be in the store, leave, and then with those box trucks, we're able to back into that loading zone. Um, and obviously these are generally, we'll nail down the times a little bit more, but generally we look at delivery times at, during the off peak hours where the majority of the parking spaces um, are not in high demand. Um, so the, there is area there, even if it were a high demand where the, Truck can get away from the general population circulation, not impede any type of backup or maneuvering of customers while they can wait their turn to get into that loading zone. All right, so that's the spot that you're talking about. That's again I 95. I put you in nickel, there's going to be a sun, it's just no parking. Right? No, I'm, I'm parking on sign. I know, I got it. I got it. You're saying the staging area. Where you're gonna put where uh, I'm the coke guy, right? If someone I'm Kara Gately parked in that spot, so why can't you get to that loading done? So you gotta wait for Kara to leave the store so I can back in, right? Correct. Right. So that that area is the part that's up against I-95 on the on the top side of your site plan. Um, not 995. There's an abutter directly adjacent to us, but yeah, it's getting close uh, to. The yep, sorry, you're right. That's that is right. That's um. Fletcher's parking lot. Got it. You're right. But it's on the north side of the lot. Or the, the, the on the south. Yeah, the east side. The east side of the lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the top of the plan. It's on the top. Plan north. Oh yeah. All right. That's fine. And, and like I said, that's not going to be anticipated to be a long stage um for for those delivery vehicles. Right. And right. and I think the you know. As I said, I think it's worth emphasizing that to the extent that there are peak hour windows where people are coming in, or we have pa this is the classic pass by use. You're stopping in on your way to the highway to get gas on your way to work. It's unlikely, if not um, virtually uncertain, that there would be deliveries during those peak hour windows because we wouldn't do that in order to oh, accommodate that. If we were to have a application permit, would that be acceptable to your client? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. If we were to put those limitations in your special application or any of your permits, would your client be acceptable? Would that be acceptable to your client? Certainly ask them. Okay. Great, thank you. Because that's what we typically do. I mean, trust me, I go to Cumberland Farms in Rhode Island all the time. I let them sit in the car and my kids are in the store for 15 minutes getting their coats. It's, it's painful because I want to get to the beach. <laughs> They're not. They're not in and out in three minutes. I, I, I was going to say, if if I I sympathize, my my boys are the same way. If I, they don't have them in the car, I will tell you, I am probably a th you know three minute person in and out. So not my family. But I stay in the car because this way my wife has to pay and I don't. 
All right, let's keep moving. Um, back to Jim and do the technical stuff. I, I, Jim, if you're set with it, I'd really like to listen to Joe Canis and let him yeah. go through his speech. Yeah, you... I'm all set. I was just closing up on the DOT stuff, which were more technical uh, construction related details, nothing that uh, fundamentally changed anything on the site plan. Um, you know, so with that makes, makes me think of Michael Galante. Well, they, they because they own the adjacent property, they look at it relative to both drainage, traffic. So they're looking at it from various aspects, drainage, and and the fact that it's not only we want to look at owns the adjacent property. They, I guess I got tickets. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It, so you're talking about DOT owns the forest to the, to the north. north. I got you. I got you. I apologize. I, I, I fault. No, uh, no so that, worries. That they, is your that is your area of expertise. Yeah. So they, they had some uh, very minor uh, comments regarding uh, some construction driveway details, things of that nature, which have been incorporated into the site plans. Again, no fundamental change uh, to the overall site operations, circulation, or anything of that nature. More of just hitting some DOT standards. Got it. Um, other than that, uh, we, you can turn it over to Joe to provide feedback on the stormwater aspect. This Joe's our man. If he said it's okay, it's okay. Okay, right, take it away. Great, Joe. All right, thank you. Uh, for the record, Joseph Canis uh, with High and Bond. Uh, we're engaged by the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission to review the stormwater and uh, sediment erosion control aspects of the application. I've uh, written two letters. Uh, my initial letter was after my first site visit. Um, that was dated September 16th, 2020. And uh, the applicant responded to the comments I had in that letter. Most of the comments were minor and technical in nature. There weren't any, um, you know, anything that you know significantly changed the design. Uh, and then I issued a second follow-up letter on October 19th in response to uh, the new information submitted by the applicant. Uh, and uh, uh, as uh, Jim said, uh, uh, the, the remaining comments are are pretty minor. Uh, most of the comments have been addressed, but the remaining ones are fairly, you know, pretty minor. Um, for example, just um, documenting the time of concentration path on the watershed map, which is just more of like a dotting your eyes, crossing your T's type of thing. Uh, and then uh, the other comment uh, that was outstanding too was uh, just the addition of manholes at uh, uh, two pipe junctions. Uh, there were two locations uh, where they needed to add manholes. And then, uh, as Jim also said, I had a comment on sediment erosion control, uh, which is just providing a size of a proposed sediment trap. But uh, in concept, you know, it's a good location for the trap. I just need verification of the size properly. Uh, so that said, uh, look, you know, the stormwater management uh, plan that they put together is uh, it, it meets the requirements of the town. Uh, you know, subject to uh, those uh, my comments, my October 19th letter. Uh, it's uh, an overall it's an improvement over the uh, stormwater management scheme that exists on the site now. Uh, on the existing site, there is no treatment of the stormwater. Uh, and there's also uh, a break in the curb uh, along the, um, side, on the east side that uh, is uh, uh, right up against the water course there. And that allows uh, runoff to, sh to sheet directly into the water course. So, uh, that situation is being addressed. Uh, they are providing an uh, oil water separator, uh, so they are providing treatment. Uh, there's a decrease in impervious surface, a uh, slight decrease, but uh, it's certainly uh, any you know decrease in impervious surface helps. Uh, and there was also uh, some sensitivity in terms of the grading uh, to make sure that there was no sheet flow across uh, the uh, fueling area. So that kind of sits like on a, almost like a localized high point uh, with the stormwater graded around it. Uh, and also the same is true for the dumpster area in the back. Uh, the, the stormwater doesn't sheet flow across that. They've uh, put a small swale around that. So I was happy to see that. Uh, so uh, from a stormwater uh, and a sediment erosion control standpoint, uh, it's it, uh, subject to addressing these uh, last remaining comments that uh, complies with the regulations in my opinion. So at the end of the day, you're going to sign off on this um, site plan as designed. Uh, once they add those manholes, yeah. Yeah, and but, uh, <laughs> they're real close. 
we, the, the applicant takes no exceptions to making those modifications. Okay. Um, let me let me ask another question that's kind of sort of related for the both of you guys. And Amy, you can switch into. It's it's in my business, and uh, we call things called test fits. And and I went down to South Jersey this weekend and went to three different uh, gas station and fast food and uh, Wawa's and Cumberland Farms. Did you ever look at turning the the, the project um, ninety degrees the other way, where the, um, the pumps would be in the front facing the post road and the the building would be in the back against the um, adjacent private owner's parking lot? Yeah, um, I could address that too, Amy. You could add on too afterwards. Uh, the answer to that is yes. You know that is the conventional layout for um, gas station canopy up front convenience store in the back. However, when you look at our property, um, we're limited to our, our site driveway in one particular location. So we don't have flexibility moving that due to the no access line from the DOT. Uh, and then looking at the property, it is standing at the road, it's wider than deeper. Yes. So, when you turn, so when you turn that entire property 90 degrees, we now have a 20 foot rear yard setback that we're gonna be subject to. So now the building that we have that's close to a property line needs to get pulled further into the site. And we also have um, a setback and buffer zones in the front. So once we adhere to those setbacks, we're looking at the depth component, all the drive aisles and um, maneuvering areas get to a point where it's not safe for pedestrian and uh, vehicular traffic, as well as we can't get fire apparatus and delivery vehicles into the site. So long story short, it's not deep enough to get that conventional uh, layout that's needed for site circulation, fire apparatus and delivery vehicles. Got it, agreed. No, you're fine. I, I, I know the depth is the issue and also the 20 yard set, a 20 foot setback at the back is the issue and push them and do things. So yeah, it, it gets tight really quick when you when you apply those um, setbacks. Got it, understood. Because uh, I was just trying to pull it away from the from the um, building next door, which is we keep calling the Fletcher office building. Um, um, and Amy, I apologize, switching gears again. With regards to the canopy and the recessed of the lights in the canopy, is it's where's that stand? Because the Wawa's and the Cumberland Farm stand in South Jersey have all the lights recessed. Yeah, so actually we're, that's one of the things that we're working on um, with respect to the ARB is the canopy design. Um, we had, it was, you know, originally in the plan before you is a, is a flat roof. Um, one of the comments from Mr. Fletcher was for us to look at what we could do um, to minimize, you know, the view from, from his office building. And so we are looking at um, in the most recent submission to ARB did have a roof on the canopy that would um, do some uh, provide screening and sort of mimic the the design of the building um, but it's it's certainly and and obviously the the lighting and how that that plays in um, is all all part of that uh, design issue so we're going to talk about that another day yes did you could buy the same exact canopy as that Wawa's got where the lights right. are up, they're not right. down. And, and in fact, I will tell you, we have been looking at the types of canopies on other stores um, in the area. Cumberland Farms is obviously the most um, prominent in this region. Uh, so that's that's one of the things. Um, and then there's another, another station, slightly smaller scale, but called Wheels. Uh, that's in a number of locations. I think the closest one to you is in Westport. Um, no, it's it's at have, my house. I go to Wheels. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they, they, have, they have a similar, you know, a different kind of canopy, and that exactly feeds into some of the issues we're discussing with with ARB as far as, um, you know, frankly, a little bit of design of making sure that depending on what we wind up with for the building, um, we don't want to put a really modern canopy next to a, you know, colonial looking building. And so, yeah, and, and so the lighting and, and all that factors in. 
I just want to make sure the lighting is the, the common farms that you may be referencing is when I talked about the last one that said exit 24. They had the lights hanging down. That's what we don't want. We want to reassess like the Wawa in Marlboro, New Jersey. And I took a picture of it and gave it to Jeremy. So I'll show it to you. All right. Um, okay, so Caddis is done. The lights we talked about. What's up next year? Amy might have one more topic and that might be it. Really? We'll get to the public after that. Okay. Amy, you. I got the last one. Um, uh, I'm just making a note about your Wawa. Um, I can give you the address if you need it. What? I can give you the address if you need it. It's on route either 170 or 173. Okay, we will we will take a look. Um, and so I think the last thing that we wanted to touch on was um, something that was brought up by the commission, and then also in Mr. Fletcher's letter and Mr. Oben's letter um, about you know. A little bit about operations, safety, security, those sorts of things. Um, obviously, we touched on operations with respect to delivery vehicles um, and that kind of thing, but just um, circling back to the issues or concerns about uh, safety on the site, obviously that ties into the lighting that we want to make sure there's, there's proper lighting on the site, that everybody um, feels safe and secure when they're getting gas or getting out of their car. Uh, late at night. Um, the property is in fact, and in the building design is to is um, made to ensure that there's adequate lighting from and visibility from the store uh, inside out to the pumps uh, to make sure that there's uh, proper visibility. Um, same thing with the, um, you know, the canopy lighting. So those are again, balancing all of the interests of you know, making sure that we have a, an adequate design and adequate safety. Um, and then for truly kind of operational, um, there are video, there's video cameras uh, on the property. Um, the recording is uh, kept, can be given to the police in the event of uh, any kind of incident. And uh, certainly uh, we don't allow any kind of loitering on the site. Uh, so that's, you know, they'll, they'll be posted, uh, no loitering signs, um, and that is, that is enforced. Um, if there be, a, you know, appears to be any kind of problem with that, um, it's, it's something that we have worked with um, the police in other jurisdictions if, if it becomes um, an issue. Right. The, uh... So, so it's going to be the dairy and police department's job to enforce your no loitering policy, which you will enforce via signs. No, we would, we would, the, the store manager or employees would enforce no loitering. It would okay. be if the That's what your if, workers have issues. I mean, you're going to have them confronting customers who are loitering. We, I think, with any business, just like. If there was somebody loitering on the off in, on my office property, I would ask them to leave. Yeah, but people don't loiter in offices like they loiter in 7-Eleven. Um, and and we're not expecting a loitering problem. We're just saying that when it has come up, have you? Um, I've been to 7-Elevens a lot in my life. I grew up on Long Island. There is more 7-Elevens there than almost anywhere. I was at a a tournament in Annapolis, Maryland last year where we had to make sure, and these were teenage boys, did not go anywhere near the 7-Eleven in downtown Annapolis, because every night we were there, there was a fight, there were weapons taken out, the employees, you know, they can't, and I, I don't think they were expected to get in the middle of an altercation between people. So is it going to be the Dairy and Police Department's job to enforce enforce your no loitering policy? Or will you have adequate security beyond video cameras and lighting? If if there was a problem, we would absolutely take whatever measures that eventually became necessary. And in some circumstances, if the police needed to be called because someone was disruptive, just like any other taxpayer in the town of Darien, the, the police might need to respond. But that's no different if, if people were loitering at Starbucks and got into a fight, or if teenage boys were hanging out at Burger Shakes and Fries and got into a fight. It's, it's the same thing. And so we we take corporate policy. You know, this is a corporate owned store. This is not a franchise. It's something that's taken seriously. And with, with all due respect, if I could finish my answer, please. Yeah. 
Thanks. Without interruption. So we take this seriously and it is something 7-Eleven has been uh, a corporate leader in this area for security. And it's something that they have, um, you know, implemented a policy. It was originally work, you know, they worked with the federal government to develop it. It is something that is a strong position. If ultimately a situation arises and the police need to be called, yes, the Darien police would respond, but that's no different than any other property or frankly, any other gas station in Darien. I understand that the Darien police will respond. That wasn't my question. And you brought up that you're a corporate, your client is a corporate leader in security and work with the federal government. Can you provide us with a copy of your corporate security policies? Uh, to the extent that they are not, um, they're not going to reveal any kind of um, breach of, you know, I don't want to give out something that would reveal the record, policy. not me. Excuse me? You, uh, you and you raised into the record that they're a they're a leader in corporate security and that their policy has been worked on with the federal government. And I was just asking if those could be provided to us as part of to address our legitimate security concerns. Okay, so if I may, this is this point, is this let me turn it over to um, Melissa Dolloff, who is our corporate you. representative from 7-Eleven, who can talk about the corporate policies. She's here on the call. Um, let me have her take it over. Record, so generally speaking for 7-Eleven operations, um, there is very few stores that have a lot of loitering. You may be Can you to some. Oh, uh, Melissa, I'm sorry, Melissa, yes. can you just state your name and, and position for the record? I'm, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Melissa Dolloff. I'm a area leader for 7-Eleven, area operations mm -hmm. leader. So you're based like in New England here with us? Uh, yes, actually, I just started um, supervising the corporate stores in the Connecticut area. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and I reside in Rhode Island. Um, so oh, wow. <laughs> typically speaking for operations, security, you know, she mentioned all the lighting. She mentioned all the, the security windows. Um, there's typically generally not a lot of loitering that becomes an issue. Uh, we do have outdoor cameras in areas that we in locations that we believe are issues and in some in some cases we have hired outside security during peak hours during the, if it's a over very busy overnight store that type of situation to be correct i'm sorry this is the anticipated to be a 24-hour overnight store yes um most most 7-elevens are yes i'm not familiar with this particular yeah no location. we asked that yes it is we asked that question last time okay it's a 24 hour story so it's a, the bottom line is if, if security becomes an issue as as a policy it sounds like and i know a lot of other people do it they could could hire an outside security service to stand in the parking lot yes it, it does get done if, if necessary yeah thank you like at my bank branch now, there's a cop that stands out front in, in Stanford. Really? Yeah. That's what it's to see there every day at two Bank of America branches. Yep. I, don't know why. I got it. That's fine. Oh, yeah. That answer your question, Kara? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Melissa. Um, okay. So that was the last item, Amy, for you was, was um, for security. You just muted yourself. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so that was that was it. If there are any other, um, I think we've touched on everybody. Um, but if there are any other questions you have, with the understanding that we'll be back on the 11th to deal with the um, uh, hopefully resolve the various traffic issues. I think um, it certainly sounds like everybody is in agreement that our stormwater um and those technical That's items right. are are in agreement so uh hopefully mr canis can have the night off and uh if there's anything else that you want us to look into certainly i think the the question was the your question mr chairman was the the recessed lighting um and then ms gately's concern uh or question was about the approval how the other gas stations in town were approved without those um you know under yeah. under the existing regs yeah, that's fine. And the other thing, I, I just want to make sure, one second, Kara, I just want to make sure that we know what the monument signs are going to look like. I mean, at the end of the day, 
Z, uh, the P and Z commission has final say over everything. You know, right. if, if, you know, if ARB, ARB is a recommendation board, if they recommend the color pink, you know, and we say it should be black, it's black. So they're a recommendation board. With regards to the sign, we typically get cutouts and, and markouts of signs, you know, so if it's, if, if this 48 square foot sign doesn't pass ZBA and you're back to where you're supposed to be, that's fine. I 90% I remember that when we did the signage regulations, Glenn Chalder had pictures, gas station signs with the with the fuel price. Wow. Thank you. I, 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 Amy, just for your edification, <laughs> we had Glenn, when we did the signage regulation, look yeah. at this stuff at nauseum. Right now, you have got the pricing to the left. I could swear it's on the bottom. And when I go to Hilton Head, all the gas stations got the pricing on the bottom. Great. Okay, so just I just want to see what it looks like and make sure we're all on the same page. So there's no spread. And and that is certainly we can we've been asked um I think by ZBA about some uh some other questions about the signage. So we can in preparing that we can provide it to you as well. That's great. And I get it if it's 45 feet off of the road, which is what you're saying it's gotta be because of whatever reason, you're in the middle of the parking lot, you're next to fuel pump one. That's, I mean, that's in fact um, one of the things that, and we can we can talk right. about that. Um, I'll put it together. But in fact, the the issue becomes that if we were to be um, parallel with the canopy, we wind up either very close to Mr. Fletcher's building, which we obviously wanted to avoid, um, in the middle of our parking lot, or um, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. That's fine. Great. Right? So we're good. Um, Mr. Commissioner, Mr. Chairman, can I? Put Raise an issue just yes, uh, as, a heads up, uh, as a heads up for uh, Attorney Suchin's. Um, the last time around, uh, I did inquire about whether or not uh, this was a right turn only exit, and um, and I was quickly told it is not. And since I've been there before, I checked it, and there's signage at least. The signage is clearly right turn only on both sides of the uh, entrance and exit. The, as you're going out <clears throat> on either side, you'll see arrows pointing to the right. Um, and the, the chairman has pointed out maybe that was not a requirement of the uh, special permit, but I don't, and I don't know because that was a long time ago. But somebody saw some virtue in it being right turn only. And since I see some benefit to Birch Road in a right turn only, and since it's common along Post Road, I thought I ought to highlight that. I'll be interested in hearing from your traffic folks on that subject. Right, and I think just in response to that, I just remind you about the conversation um, in Mr. Galante's representations. It's your last hearing where his recommendation was that, um, and you can we actually prepared the, the transcript of it for the ZBA. Um, you can go back and look at it yourself too. But his recommendation is that if there was going to be um, access that there be the dedicated left because he believe and right out not leave it a right only because he believes that the safer design is to allow the left rather than to um design it and have people do the left illegally so i guess that's certainly okay. something we can we can revisit with him on the um 10th but but his comments were were pretty clear on that yeah, George, we'll we'll make sure that Michael Galante signs off. If I mean, like like I said at the last meeting, he wanted and the police department wanted and other people wanted a left turn only at a Trader Joe's. I mean, a right turn only at a Trader Joe's, and and we did what they say on this application. The issue was that there's only one way in, one way out. So he, it, I mean, Mike recollects that he didn't recommend he didn't recommend that when he gives us his final letter of the next meeting. You know, we can go over that. To, to your satisfaction. Yeah, good. I'll be interested to hear how a uh, illegal left turn is uh, more hazardous than a legal left turn, but whatever. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that the next time. Just thank you. Yeah, there's, there is, I should note, ample opportunity to make a right-hand turn, go down by the car wash and come back. I mean, right. That, people do that all the time. Yeah. The In fact, if you want to go to the car wash, from the center of Darien, that's what you do. Right. Okay. And it's certainly what you're supposed to do out of Dutchess. Yeah. Um, okay. And now, 
Costco up there and more anticipated kids from Birch walking to the 7-Eleven, which is going to be a bigger draw for them than Duchess. I can't see how illegal left turns or legal left turns would be safer <laughs> given a crosswalk is right there. I'm happy to give you to, to pull up his transcript, but, but his recommendation was to allow the left. Yeah. It's, okay, it's, then I'll, I'll, I, it. I'll, I'll ask him about it. Yeah, I, I actually recall him saying that, but I don't think that was that was that was absolute that was in a vacuum. I, I yeah. think that's not in that's none of the analysis that we had last time included anything about Birch Road. You're right. So you're 100 correct. And we we uh, can uh, we can go over this. A, that's that's. I hope you're hearing that. That's an important issue to this committee. This Understood. Committee. That was one of the yeah. reasons that you know we had. Um, you know, asked for Mr. Galante's comment, and it was, in fact, Mr. Mr. Warble, it was your question because um, I had just reviewed it for for the ZBA mm -hmm. about about that left turn. So we can we can discuss that on the on the tenth. But the other thing, Mr. Chairman, was um, I know that there are uh, at least Mr. Fletcher's on the call. I don't know whether you were going to take public comment um, yeah. this evening. So if we're there's anything it, there, we can respond as well. We're doing that as soon as as soon as you give me the green light. Um, uh, thank you. Um, commission members, I'd like to open this up to public comment. Um, I think we heard from all five. Um, actually, well, Jennifer didn't chime in, but I think everybody will definitely have a chance to talk again. Um, but I'd like to open up for the for public comment. It's now 930. Um, and Jeremy's giving me a heads is a good idea. Um, Jenna, are you OK with that, too? Yep, thank you. OK. Um, with that being said, is anybody from the general public like to speak to this application? Um, I'm going to let Mr. Nick Fletcher go first. Since he was there at the last meeting. Um, hey, Fred, if you want to kind of queue up people um, or if you want to get queued up via Fred, there's a bunch of people on the screen. Um, I'd like to make some order. Someone's Bob Mazin, I see you're here. Um, if you don't mind, um, as a courtesy, would you mind going last? We would like to see the best for last. Oh, I thought that was Nick would be the best for last, but no, uh, I can wait. Sense. I'll wait. He's got, he has more hair than you do. <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Fletcher. Um, if any members of the public, if any members of the public would like to speak this evening, please just type uh, your desire to do so into the chat box so we can line you up. Thank you. Um, first up, thank you guys for your time, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the commission. Um, I really appreciate this. Um, so I guess I know the, the commission is, I think, fairly familiar with uh, with myself and, and my group, but just uh, I think for the benefit of of the uh, of the meeting, um, I'll just quickly introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Nick Fletcher. I am one of the owners at 320 and 330 Post Road. Um, we purchased. We are developers ourselves, um, so we are. You know, I think acutely aware of, of what's going on and the intention, um, motivation and strategies that the applicant has put forth uh, for the site. Um, we purchased our property at 32330 in 2018. Um, as most of you probably know, the, it's a two building portfolio of uh, commercial office. Um, the building was in quite disarray. It was absentee ownership. Um, and it was the occupancy had been driven down quite low to nearly 6% um, when we acquired it in April of 2018. Um, we underwent a pretty intensive uh, and drawn out capital expenditure and renovation process to the entire campus, uh, as well as the structures in, uh, themselves. And the idea was to, to really bring these buildings back to life um, and to bring them in line with what Darianne has come to expect for commercial real estate. Uh, I think we've done a, a pretty good job of that. Um, we've been, you know, our success, I think, is, is demonstrated through our ability to lease up the properties. And we're currently right now uh, on the verge of 74% occupancy, which I think is a testament uh, to what we've done and, and what Darianne has to offer, um, which is, I think, a really important point. Um, and there's a, you know, Amid everything that's going on with COVID, it, I think it just it underscores uh, the value that Darian offers to people both locally in Connecticut, uh, but even outside the state. Um, so 
I guess this is this is where I want to go with this. Um, as I mentioned, we are developers. We understand what's going on. Um, but there's a very clear, I think, fundamental uh, issue that we're taking with this site, which is that it's being overdeveloped. Um, there's, I think, you know, I, I'm going to try and go through, you know, as quickly as I can, all the points that I've made in my in my letters and in my in the material that was submitted. Um, but I think there's a couple that I really want to. I think I want to just drive the point on. Um, so this this idea about the property being overdeveloped, I think, is important. Um, not only from a parking standpoint, uh, but more importantly from circulation, uh, location of structures, signage, um, and then the really the intensity use that's that's being uh, being submitted and proposed. Um, you know, what I think the commission and I think even some of the studies is failing to, to I think, adequately um, consider is how many uses this property is going to have on, on this site. What you're proposing is you're proposing a gas station, um, which has, you know, I believe it's a total of six pumps or 12, 12 stations. You're proposing a convenience store and you're proposing a QSR or a quick service restaurant. Um, all three of these uses, I think, are separate and distinct, meaning that you're going to draw separate customers for each one of those uses. Um, I do not think that what you've experienced and what the town has experienced today with the Duchess in place adequately represents what is going to happen in the future. Um, not only are you drawing more people from off the highway, you're drawing more, more from Norwalk, you're going to be drawing from other locations. Um, and then there's the fact that given this, this intensity of use and this change of intensity of use, the requirements of the site have to support that. Um, so I think some of the topics that were discussed today, specifically around parking, are, are really interesting um, because you're talking about everything from do you have adequate count if there's a tanker, a fuel tanker in place, or if you've got box trucks making deliveries. Um, and in maybe a conventional, more traditional setting, probably yes, it probably does suffice. But I think that you're underestimating what those three uses are going to going to create and the congestion that that's going to bring. Um, there's going to be more parking requirements, and there's more, more than anything, there's going to be more time spent on this site. Um, somebody going in to get a chicken sandwich isn't just going to sit in the car for. It's not going to take two to three minutes. It could be five to seven. Somebody coming in for you know a family looking to make a stop is not just getting gas. They're getting snacks. And they're getting a soda fountain from the from the from the QSR. So there's a lot more that that that, that how that's going to impact. And then in addition, this pedestrian sidewalk that has been introduced just I think it was probably back in May or June I believe is when they installed it. Um, we haven't none of that's been factored into to anything. I think uh, Mr. Warble and uh, Ms. Gately have brought that up um, several you know several times about what that crosswalk does from the circulation and how that traffic is going to change um, with that sidewalk in place. Um, so I, I think these are, I, I really think that that needs to be thought through. Um, that is, a, in my mind, one of the biggest concerns that I have with the proposed site development plan and, and how this, this plot circulates. Um, as, I, as I think through sort of the next layer of questions that I have, um, you know, I'm thinking about this a little bit selfishly, obviously, as, as a business owner myself, and and looking at you know this product that I've created in, in my office building, um, having grown accustomed to what's next door, understanding that change is going to occur, and I'm I'm okay with that. I'm I'm, I'm aware that things have to change, and, and we're uh, that part of my value and part of what I do is is to promote change and positive change, um, but I, I don't think that this is thoughtful change. Um, I, I, you know, I, as I mentioned, I, even the orientation, I think the chairman had proposed this 90, 90 degree pivot of the site. And to me, that was, that's precisely how I was looking at it. Um, but this is, this is a, a consequence of the property being overdeveloped. The reason why the building is where it is, the reason why the canopy is where it is, the reason the trash is where it is, is because they're trying to maximize this site as much as they can. And to be honest with you, right, I think it's more than it should. Um, so that's, that's, I think needs to be, that, that needs to be considered into the, into the whole, the whole mix. Um, 
as an as the owner of this property, right? There's there's a lot of um, you know, requests that I've made in my letter about everything from the location of the trash to screening to what are the smells and the odors that are going to be a, you know, a result and a byproduct of having a QSR, a gas station, and a convenience store to everything to safety and what does a 24-hour or 24-7 um, operation next to my building where I have, you know, I've got in my covered garage, literally six feet away, I've got nearly at any given time during the day, I've got, you know, several million dollars in cars just, and some of which are unlocked, you know, it's like, I, I can't, I can't not be aware of what that does to our tenants and how my tenants would feel about the risk that they may be, you know, exposed to as we talk of 24 hours and something that we've also talked about, which is just the brand itself and, and what is a discount brand in 7-Eleven. Um, I, you know, I, I, I understand that this is, you know, as of right, and, and so I think there's, you know, there's there's things that can be done, and I've I've indicated those in my letter. I've been screening um, to, you know, what the mechanicals are going to, you know, how those mechanicals are going to look. Um, I'm I'm assuming everybody has taken a look at the photo essay that I've submitted. Um, I'm happy to share my screen if, if that's something that that can be that if we want to walk through that. But I'm I'm also going to rely that everybody's. Everybody's been there. Um, no, it's it's the, your your letters in the record. We got it. Yeah, so you, you got that. You got the photo essay, and it's without. And I think you know, obviously, I think the, the applicant has made a wise decision to to look at the, the canopy and, and the pivoting of the uh, the pitching of the roof. Um, and I, I I do see that there's obviously there's screening that's been put near the trash, which is certainly appreciated. But I to be honest with you, I, I still don't think the tr the location of the trash makes any sense. I mean, the, even as we are talking about the where the deliveries are occurring, and even just as a, you know, to be quite honest, even as just a good neighbor, being mindful of things like that, you know, I, I can't help but scratch my head. And I, I haven't even, nobody from 7-Eleven or from the application has even reached out to me about, hey, by the way, we're, we're going to be next door to you guys. We look forward to a, you know, a healthy relationship. Like, you know, part of that starts, starts to affect me and impact me as I think through you know my letter and, and how I approach this application. The letter um, number twenty-four. Average yeah, handy. Uh, yeah. so I, I guess the last point that I'm going to make is that this part of the town is, is really starting to set. Yeah, everything that Don Vicaro has done, I think what we've done, I'm hoping to have more of an impact Thanks. on this town. But this is really a gateway to Darien, and so it's a first impression for people that are coming in um, from from the east, and I think that it's the commission's responsibility to preserve character. Um, this goes everything from the cadence to the to the to the to the buildings and the structures, the architecture, um, stylistically, everything that everything that I've mentioned in my submittals should be heavily and you know heavily weighed because it does impact the character of this side of town. Um, and so I would I would just ask that there be serious consideration given. Um, I, I know that this is a you know, the site is ripe for development. I understand that, uh, but we need to do more as a community. And I think Gary Ann deserves the, be the the very best. And what I'm seeing today, I, I don't believe is the very best. I think this can be better. And that's 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 where I stand right now. I'm happy to ask any answer any questions, elaborate on any bit that um, that is unclear uh, or field any questions from the applicant. Okay, thanks, Nick. I appreciate it. We got your letter. You know, we'll go over it it's i don't really want to get to a deep deep q a um because i think there's some other people want to speak uh, but you know you're a developer you have a pre-application in front of us for for bank of america you know that's it that's a small site this thing's one acre Thanks. you know it's i, know it's, I mean you, you know uh, uh, certainly, certainly understand it but i can i think the, the the commission is also aware of the product that i'm capable of delivering uh and there's a there's a company there got it um, Fred, who do you get next? Mike, please introduce yourself. My name is uh, Michael J. Fox. I'm the executive director of the Gasoline and Automotive Service Dealers of America. It's a trade association that represents the mom and pop gasoline retailers, such as the former tri Mobile, now the Mobile Station, Smart Foods right up the road, and Ken Cromber's location down the street. 
Um, I, I certainly, and I also was the owner of Mike's Mobile, Mike's Service Center at 600 Washington Boulevard in Stanford on the corner of Washington Boulevard in Richmond Hill, which is now the RBS headquarters building that got sold last year. I worked on that deal when you got when you got taken over. Exactly. I remember that very well. So, so what I can tell you, and I'm going to do my very best to be 100% honest and polite, but there is a lot of misinformation that was given to you by 7-Eleven's attorney. First and foremost, this is being proposed as moving you into the 21st century, and you already have service stations along the road. So this is very similar to what they're doing. One, I worked with Standard Oil and Tom Sniffen at Tri-S Mobile and helped them get their permits from the town. One of the things that we don't necessarily like as the industry, but I think we've figured out how to work it very well, you want to keep service stations and the growth of service stations to a special use permit so that you as the zoning commission can determine how many of these you need. Number one, this is the size of this building, the use of the property, the size of the canopy and the pumps. This is a facility that would normally be built on I-95 or the Merritt Parkway and is a highway facility. Each one of those fueling positions is rated at 1 million gallons of fuel annually, or for six pumps, we don't call them pumps anymore, we call them multiple product dispensers because you can fuel all the grades from both sides. So this location is projected at doing 6 million gallons of fuel a year. I don't care what the attorney said, I ran a three and a half million gallon mobile station at the corner of Washington Boulevard and Richmond Hill. It is a nightmare getting gas deliveries. You cannot plan, you can, you can mandate them. They are determined by when the fuel is sold, how busy it is around holidays, snow, all of those things come into factor. And when you're gonna run out of gas, you have to get a delivery. You are going to have a huge tractor trailer tanker coming in there at the times that you don't want it to, a busy holiday weekend or busy holiday Friday, and it's going to have to go in there sometime between 11 in the morning and 7 at night. It's just not avoidable. Not enough product underground. You also heard earlier that the approximate time is about four to six minutes. Well, fuel pumps in Connecticut are regulated, can only be able to pump 10 gallons a minute. If you take the time to put the credit card in the pump, get out of your car, fuel the car, you can easily see your way over six minutes right there. The second thing, and nothing has been mentioned here tonight, is the new app that 7-Eleven has, which currently has 60 million members. That app is designed to give you the ability to come to this location on a prepaid basis, pick up your chicken, pick up your soda, pick up your cigarettes from a bag. The reason that's relevant it's going to take the number of transactions in and out of that very tiny in and out egress are going to triple because of that app. The way 7-Eleven uses that app, they can push a button and in less than five minutes, deliver information to the members of their app saying, come to our new location located at such and such an address and we'll give you a dollar off fuel for our grand opening. So they are going to reach to Norwalk, to Stanford. They're going to reach the tri-state area because it's right off the highway. The second thing is, I did notice that the exit has a right and a left-hand turn. I I've done a lot of these applications throughout the entire state of Connecticut. I don't see any way in the world DOT is ever going to allow that because if there's one person trying to go right and one person trying to go left, they block each other's view and can't see what's going on. And we already know what goes on at that intersection as far as traffic and congestion. The second comment, and you would know better than I, Mr. Chairman, that I've never seen it before where you're allowed to put a parking space in front of the dumpster. And here you have four of them. And you, I, let, trust me, I have tried that before where, where we say it's temporary, but it just doesn't work. The third really important part is you've been told that all of these deliveries will be, quote, a box truck. They're going to be a tractor trailer. 
or something larger than a box truck. That's how 7-Eleven works. They try and get one delivery. The good part is most of those deliveries will probably come later in the evening to be dropped off. In regards to security, I can tell you that Kara, I believe that's who brought up that point, is dead on. There's, there's going to be problems, and I know firsthand from what I had at my service station, they are going to run it through a camera system. You, you are going to overburden the Darien police with problems in that area, and it's not going to work. Thirdly, just for some FYI, 7-Eleven is in the process to buy out wheels. So this is a movement into Connecticut by a major discount fuel supplier. And what I'm going to tell you is this is similar to comments that were made about big box retailers eliminating the mom and pops, and then the discount is no longer a discount, you're a captive audience customer. That's exactly 7-Eleven's master plan. I know it, I've seen it, I've witnessed it. I can tell you firsthand what happens in service stations. And again, I'm shocked at some of the things that, you know, I'm working with Bob Maslin, he, he's the one who contacted me and was told, no, you can, you can use those four bases, parking spaces in front of the dumpster. Everything that I heard earlier is absolutely going to happen and more. I am not concerned at all about the tanker's ability to come into the station. I believe the tanker will enter the station, go across the front of the building and make a left and the hoses will reach the fueling facility. So it won't park, block the parking on that side. Um, in regards to your sign, a suggestion that I would make to you for whatever my opinion is worth is just go look at what you did with the sign at Trias Mobile, because that was right in the middle of your sign regulations and they need to match that sign. Pricing on the bottom, the identification of mobile or 7-Eleven on the top, and they shouldn't be able to exceed that. What I am concerned about is, Nick Fletcher is right. This is changing the character of Darien. And if you allow these proposed regulations to come through, then you're going to force the mobile station to do exactly the same thing and build a multi-use facility. So I want you to be clear, the uses on this facility are a gas station, a convenience store, a chicken place, and now a facility where basically Uber Eats and DoorDash are going to be coming in and out of left and right to get the order to take out. But that's the opposite of what you guys want. You don't want more traffic going in and out of the location because what you have there now is a bunch of people that go and park their car for 45 minutes to an hour, eat, and then leave, and then someone comes in and replaces them. If I want to go to Duchess and I'm driving by and the parking lot's full, I'm probably going to go somewhere else at Darien because I'm already there. Gas stations don't do that. The other big area I would like you to think about is when you have 12 fueling stations, one car parked at each fueling facility, that means you have ability to have 24 cars at once on the facility because one car behind each car waiting to fuel up. That's where your problems are going to come in. And again, I ran a 24-hour mobile station that started out pumping 5,000 gallons a month, a full service station with repairs. I moved my repair facility. I converted to a convenience store. And in the end, I was a 24-hour convenience store selling $200,000 of convenience store items. And uh, basically, I know what happens in them from a security standpoint. And I'll end with this and answer any questions that you might have. The other big piece of misinformation, so I think you've identified a fix, is in regards to liquor, you absolutely need to put a restriction on any type of liquor that they have to come back to you because you are the body that should determine if beer gets sold out of there because it's not true that you can't get a beer permit. I got the beer permit for 1429 East Putnam Avenue in Old Greenwich at a Shell station. It's a gas station convenience store, express lube with a car wash, and they now sell beer. So it is possible. I'm certainly not going to tell 7-Eleven how to do it, but it is possible. So again, these are things that I believe belong in the control of the board to determine how many of these type facilities you want within Darien, and more importantly, where they are.
And with that, I'll answer any questions you might have. Wow. Uh, thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. Um, before we do a Q and A, if you don't mind, commissioners, um, let's see if anybody else is in the queue. Um, you yet? Anybody else, Fred? Ken, go ahead. You got to unmute yourself. Ken Kronberg. Ken Kronberg. Houston, I think we have connection. Can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Ken Kronberg. I own and operate Dairy and Exxon. I've been there for probably 25 years, close to 30 maybe. And uh, it was a uh, full facility many years ago. He's next. Uh, where we converted it at that point to a smaller kiosk with four oh, pumps and somebody. eight fueling okay. points. I'm sorry, Ken, Ken, are you the one that's down by Shake Shack? Yes. Are you, are you no, Shake Shack? Yes. Got it. I'm I got right, you. right across the street from you guys. You got the big teddy bear outside, and we gave you um, the right to put in propane tanks a couple of years ago. That's right. Okay. Thank Go ahead. You. I'm sorry. Thank you. That's okay. So, uh, you know, I, I've been in this business like Mike, um, and I think Mike did a great job explaining what was going on here. Uh, my dad was a dealer trainer for Esso. That's how far back we go. And uh, then, which became Exxon. And my brother and I and my family owned and operated over a dozen stores and flew different different oil company flags in the state of, uh, in the Fairfield County, state of Connecticut. In fact, we were one of the first to convert from the old fashioned full facility operation to a, uh, full-blown convenience store with a larger 3,000 square foot walk-in store with fueling points out front. And uh, there's a couple of things I just wanted to touch on was one was, I think was a little bit misleading for the uh, young lady from uh, 7-Eleven, the attorney to say that they were anticipating one to two trucks, uh, fuel trucks to come into that property a week. Uh, each fuel truck holds 8,900 gallons. With the amount of money that they're putting into this facility, the location, uh, this, its proximity to I-95 and the pure volume that they're gonna do, I think was very misleading to everybody here. My guess with, with just basic projections and just being in the business my whole life, they're gonna pump between six and 8,000 gallons a day so I'll let you guys do the math. If a truck holds 8,900 gallons, that means they're going to get a truck every day and a half. So I think to say that they're going to get one, one or two trucks a week was a little bit misleading. And, and then the other part of it was that the, the pure volume of people coming in and out of that location, I think, is, is grossly misunderstood. Uh, but I'll let you know, other people smarter than me tell you that along the way. Uh, the other thing is security. Uh, the easiest target for robbery these days, and you can talk to any policeman, is a convenience store. We were robbed at Dairy and Exxon three weeks ago. We're not open 24 hours. We were closed. The uh, bad guy came in uh, the wee hours of the morning and was able to jimmy the door, get into the register, and wipe clean out all the money in the register there were two uh, perpetrators and uh, one of them just basically grabbed as many cigarette cartons as they could. They didn't do a whole lot of damage, fortunately, but they did get away. And, and we have every square inch of that property uh, under surveillance and digitally uh, recorded. They come in with masks and there's lights and so on, but they come in with masks the, they park in precarious positions where you can't see the VIN the license plate on the car. They come and they go. I'm just saying as, an, as to give you guys food for thought that when it comes to robberies, the, the, con, the convenience stores, especially seven uh, overnight stores, are the first target of robberies. And uh, I think that's about it. So I, I'll also answer any questions. I'm done. Hi, Mr. Cronenberg, can I ask you a question? Sure. And you're not as close to the 95 quarter access as this location is, correct? 
That's correct. Uh, this this location is its proximity. My, my, you know, I can do the math on what the global and a, a one exit north of them, right off the highway. We, I can find out all the stats and what kind of volumes that they do and how many robberies they've had. But when the closer proximity you are to I ninety five, the uh, more of a target you are. I mean, yeah, we had a. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You add proximity to ninety five and extended hours of operation, especially overnight 24 hour access with that proximity to 95. Doesn't that statistically increase your security? Risk? You guys, it, it does. And you, you guys, does it, does, I'm sorry, does it increase my security? Or, or the operators, not just yours. I mean, any operator who has a closer proximity to any corridor, especially an interstate corridor like I-95. Right. And you extend your hours of operation to 24 hours of operation. Um, well, Karen, I might yeah. be able to answer that for you better because my motor yeah. was right by the ramp of exit seven in Stanford. So unfor unfortunately, hours have nothing to do with it. I was robbed at six o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, 11 o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, 3 a.m., 5 a.m. So unfortunately, I, 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 it is- no, no, no disrespect. You talk about something that's 15 years ago. Oh, I, I listen. I perfectly understand that. It's you got an office building there for 15 years. No, I'm just, I'm just. The, the statistics don't change for a certain day. That's the point I'm making. Because I, I represent all the guys in the state of Connecticut, so I know the ones that are closer to 995. And the point I'm trying to make to you is, don't fool yourself thinking just because it's 24 hours and it's close. You limit it to six to eleven. They're still going to have robberies because it's close. But the proximity is a greater factor than the hours of operation. Correct. That your location was at the base of Richmond Hill Road, and, and Richmond Hill Road has changed dramatically in the last fifteen years. Yeah, but to put my service station back there, like this one is, it's located by the ramp. You have the exact same facility. And I think we just had. A, a local resident further away from 95 who was burgled last week or, or within the last month. Mr. Cronenberg, when was it? We were, we were, when we were robbed. Yeah. That location, uh, Darien Exxon was, was robbed about three weeks ago and they okay. came in in the middle of the night, but I just want to say, I don't know if everyone remembers the, uh, since we're going down that road, that location before I bought it, and Mike knows this, I bought that location from Tommy uh, uh, Sneffen. And uh, that fella was stabbed 17 times at that kiosk. And uh, his name was Carl. And uh, I think, Mike, I don't know if you remember that, but um, yeah. that was a very bad thing that happened. And that was a couple of years before I bought it. When did you buy it, Ken? About 25 years ago. We talk about something that's that's 27 years ago. I know, but like it wasn't a, a Darien police officer. I think I read in one of the submissions to the record recently that was submitted that in fact a Darien police officer was killed in the line of duty not far from this location. At the at the Duchess, he was killed investigating a break in at the oh, Duchess. At the Duchess itself? Sorry. At the Duchess itself, at, at that exact location. In the yeah. Dutch. Oh, I, when was that? Break in. He responded, and yeah. uh, I think he was shot. When? When was this? Oh, 30 years ago. Yeah, no, okay. Was so but let's let's kind of let's kind of try to keep it to uh, land use issues. I think I, mean, I get it. It's a special permit. I get it. I get it. It's so a current issue. So, Mike, so. I have a question for you, Mike. Just because now I'm like, you know, now I can't unhear what I now know. So in now recent like over the last let's say five years would you say that what you see is fairly consistent crime in these kind of uh locations close to 95 are consistent or has there been a spike or a decrease well okay here's what i can tell you really honestly factually certainly when the economy is really good and we had jobs and people able to get jobs crime goes down with covid service stations being deemed essential services Crime has skyrocketed at your local service station convenience store. When people get hungry, when people are out of jobs, they're gonna do what they have to do. 
that yeah. station that I referenced earlier at 1429 East Putnam Avenue in Old Greenwich is five miles from exit five, the on and off ramp. Their attendant was shot in the face. What? Was shot in the face. When was this? It was about three and a half to four years ago, about 11 o'clock at night. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, I am indulging the procedure, but this is certainly out of the norm. It's, it's, I know we're going, we're going off correct. I, I we we had one of those too about uh, three years ago. Can I, I I got it. I got it. We have police reports here. I got it. We try to keep this to land use issues and to special hey, permits. This, this, the, there's traffic that we're hearing about. Like I hear, I appreciate what you're saying, Amy. I, I told you, attorney. But I feel like the traffic, right? And hearing, like I'm, I'm not. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know this much, right? But you're waiting in line for gas. Now that it's brought to my attention, and I feel like other commissioners may feel the same way. It's like, yeah, right. There are, there is a lineup. Like I've waited for gas before, right? If I'm you know, like there's thought process, like the garbage parking spaces in front of garbage dumpsters. Like, yeah, that is a curious question. And now it makes me, it gives me pause to go through other applications. And where did we approve them in that way, in that many spaces? So I do think all of this, I understand we went off a little bit, but it is pertinent just kind of thinking of this like on the ground. And I appreciate Ken and Mike coming and just giving like it boots on the ground there's nothing i appreciate more than reality sometimes our high level conversations seem great in theory but in actuality we have like real life examples so i, I think that this is not so far off because sometimes we need to think rethink things especially right, I I guess, just, you also, like you also got to remember point. hold on one second amy amy hold on one second you also got to remember it's there's three other gas stations within a half a mile of this thing market share doesn't come out of any place also an i-95 truck stop it's on i-95 that's a mile from here you know mr cronenberg's gas station is at 11. is there anyone i get it, I, get it. I, I hear you guys are all equal commissioners i get it it's you have to keep it within the bounds of the application we are but in, in oh, regards should... in regards to what we put in the application they said there was going to be i think approximately 325 transactions per day for the gasoline side. I can tell you yes, that is so under With all due respect, I have a procedural argument that if somebody from the public is going to comment, I got it. Not, I just got from it. procedural rules of, of how we can keep the hearing flowing, with all due respect, if there are okay. comments from somebody and then from and, there. Actually, Ken, if you, you want to submit something for the record, and that's that's in there you're more than welcome to okay chairman but uh so go ahead Karen, what i'm sorry what, what was the question not the chairman she doesn't control the floor she I, doesn't control I, I i get it yeah all right um thank you with regards to fred do you have somebody up next but wait sorry steve i also just want to bring up something because like now we so i just downloaded the app like right. so um you know i go to dutch's for one thing only and it is a diet dr pepper with cherry flavoring okay nice so, you're welcome everyone but so now i know i have an app right and i feel like there's how many millions of users if i know i can get my specific stress soda at this place like i will seek it out like i know in new canaan where i can go on norwalk like i i'm just saying there's like traffic that we I don't, there's just there's just movement to here like i love convenience and during covid i love convenience more than ever so i will go out of my way and probably i feel like there's more traffic places where you can have something convenient where you can pick up a bag i don't have to talk to a human but i can get what i want um so that's also something to be thinking about traffic wise it's it's that's what we have traffic that's why we have traffic experts look at it you know, I mean, I got it. We can argue that the, you know, that the traffic at at um, Starbucks went up because they created an app. You know, I don't know the answer, but it's not me. Um, Fred, who's up next? Mr. Chairman, if I might just ask you to indulge one question. The traffic studies that they're doing, and I know that's controlled by your traffic yeah. department. Mike, Mike, I got it. We, we, we have traffic experts looking at it. Yeah, I'm hoping they're going to know. Let me get, let me get the other people in queue. Traffic experts. 
folks are going to know that with COVID, the gasoline sales for the traffic that's going down there is going to be down about 40%. I, I get you. But uh, we all hope that COVID's over, over in February. That's. You know, we don't, we don't, COVID's not, it goes out of perpetuity. You can't, you can't regulate the COVID. That's true. I understand so you're gonna... doing the traffic count now. Thanks, Mike. We're not, they're doing traffic counts that are being reviewed by the state. We got the guys that get paid to do that. Fred, who do you got? Bob, go ahead. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> good evening, uh, commissioners. My name is Robert Maslin and I represent a Cal Ahmed who owns the mobile station down the street at, um, I think it's 211 Post Road. I uh, wanted to make a few comments. I don't have any written submission tonight, uh, but I uh, may uh, put, uh, submit a memo or a statement with some citations uh, uh, sometime in the next couple of days if it's okay. And I, I just wanted to clarify, are we on November 10th or 11th for the next session? Someone mentioned the 11th before, but I thought it was the 10th. It's the 10th, Bob. Okay, thank you. Um, just to be clear, uh, we're, we're converting a 1,200 square foot fast food dining area to a much larger uh, multiple use uh, property including a 4,000 plus square foot convenience store with fast food counter inside and a seating area for dining, plus the fuel, plus propane sales. And they're proposing a 24 hour operation. Okay, uh, hold, these, on one, these, hold on one second. Uh, are not the, existing, the existing building's 3,025 square feet. Right, but it's about it's 1,200 there. square foot dining area. And there's been no that, That's what I meant. That, that's okay. what I, there's and an there's additional been, area for the cooking. Propane gas. Pardon? There's been no discussion of propane gas uh, I saw something in the, in the, I thought I saw something in the application, but that's become typical of service stations now, and that's probably going to come into the future if it's not in the application now. Uh, these uses are, as they're proposed, are not uh, allowed under the regs unless they, you grant the text amendments. Just in response to a question that was asked earlier, gas stations with convenience stores are permitted under the current regulations by special permit. Uh, and that is section 156.2D. It's, it's allowed as an accessory use to the gas station, which I would suspect means the primary use is the gas station the accessory use is the non-automotive related sales where the sales is a lesser part of the operation. That's what's allowed in the SB zone. What I think is being proposed here is a primary use convenience store with the gas station as at least a co-primary use, which is not mentioned in the regs, or where the gas is a uh, an accessory to the convenience store use. But to get back to the question that was asked before, yes, this sort of mixed gas station and convenience store use is allowed under the current regulations if you do it right. The other point I want to make, and then I'll get into the proposed text amendments more uh, in more specific uh, terms, is I'm not sure why this is in front of the ZBA for location approval. The legislature eliminated the ZBA location approval process in 2003. I know there's mention of it in your regulations, but uh, uh, the only uh, approval that's required by statute now is from a zoning commission or planning and zoning commission, where there is right. a planning and zoning yeah, commission. Let's, let's let the ZBA do what the ZBA does, and then we'll take the recommendation. I, my point is, Whatever ZBA does on the location is no, in no way binding on the Planning and Zoning Commission. It's totally separate. I get it 100%. And, and, it, and I would say further that it's not even advisory, uh, totally separate process. Um, the, to ZBA, so. Right. The, the proposed. Like sorry. And you like Jeremy. 
I what? Um, <laughs> just move on. We're fine. Okay. The amendments are not uh, consistent with the plan of conservation and development. I, I just note um, there are dining areas in places in the SB zone, one in particular, which uh, is before you right now, that has a dining area less than the required 1,200 square feet. The reason for that is that a previous building had dining less than 1,200 feet. Shake Shack is in yes, the other SB zone that has 1,200 feet of seating area. There's no reason to change the regs after you have an established SB zone with a minimum 1,200 foot dining area in order to enable this 100 square feet or 150 square feet or whatever it's going to be uh, as an indoor dining area. The reason for that limitation was that the town years ago decided back in the 50s and 60s, it didn't want the old uh, Carol's, Wetson's, McDonald type in their original format where you drive up, park, run in, get your food, and then eat it in the car. And that's why the, the dining area has a minimum 1,200 foot uh, 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 requirement. So that's already in the regulations. It reflects uh, what the policy is in the SB zone and there's no reason to change it. Um, this is not um, a situation where you're allowing or being asked to allow a local business. This is a major undertaking where 7-Eleven, as we have heard, now has an app. It's, it's heavily marketing uh, its stores currently. If you go on to their corporate website, there are news releases after news releases about how they've uh, expanded their marketing and their reach in leaps and bounds. This app will attract traffic off I-95 that would not otherwise come to this site or come into the post road in Darien, primarily because Darien has not allowed billboards or signs visible from the post road in many, many uh, visible to the turnpike um, or from the turnpike rather in many, many years. The apps now uh, get around that and this is, is really going to increase the traffic uh, intensity. In addition to that, 7-Eleven uh, is now marketing itself through ordering platforms like Uber Eats, Grubhub and Instacart and a whole delivery system. So these delivery cars or vehicles are going to be in and out in addition to the regular customer traffic. That should be considered at least and reflected in the traffic study. Uh, this site, this proposed uh, combination of uses is not consistent with the small New England type character for businesses along the post road and in Darien generally. Uh, the traffic at the entrance and exit, particularly the turn turning issues uh, are not consistent with the plan of conservation development recommendation for enhancing uh, uh, the function of the roadway system through access management in and out of driveways, um, provide for efficient travel up and down the post road. Before COVID hit, I'm sure you remember during rush hour, beginning of the day and at the end of the day, when something happens on the turnpike, you get a massive traffic jam on the post road. This is going to make it worse because while people are uh, stuck in traffic, the 7-Eleven Act is going to draw people to this um, um, to this particular uh, location, um, increasing the problem even more. Um, and this should be addressed in the traffic study. It's something I would think Mike uh, Galanti would would. Uh, uh, ask the uh, applicant's traffic consultant to consider. We can pass that on. That's a great idea. I uh, I think somebody mentioned the uh, right turn only exit. I don't see a reason to change that. I looked at the uh, tractor trailer circulation uh, diagram that was submitted. That looks like a pretty tight maneuvering uh, arrangement, but what I think is even more significant is when that tractor trailer swings over to the left side of the eastbound lane, 
in order to make that wide turn into the site, you're at the beginning of a, a part of the road where it, it separates from one lane to two lanes in the eastbound direction. Uh, there's going to be situations where somebody's going to be driving along the right hand side, see the truck move to the left and be right alongside the truck when it makes that sweeping right turn and get clipped. Um, I can see that happening. What for traffic exiting, I think Mike, uh, Mike Fox uh, talked about this. Uh, he has experience in multitude of gas stations up and down state roads. That double lane exit is certainly problematic. Uh, if it's a right turn only now, it, it should remain right turn only. Uh, the same way that the driveway to and from uh, Trader Joe's uh, is. If, if you have to make a right turn and go up and turn around, as uh, Commissioner Rand mentioned earlier, so be it. Uh, the yeah, only we're final we're thought looking, I would... We're looking into that. Michael Glanty's looking into it. I, I got that. it. I got it. The one, one point, and I think this is absolutely relevant, despite what some people say, health and safety is a zoning issue. Mm -hmm. This place will become a target. It'll become a target that would would leave open the possibility of different types of robberies, not just the guy that puts the hood on and a face mask, walks in the door and, and robs the cash register. This is right next to an entrance ramp, and it wouldn't be very difficult for somebody to hide out in the bushes, wait for somebody to come in at 2 o'clock in the morning, fill their tank up, and get hijacked. Mm -hmm. uh, all the cameras in the world are not going to prevent that. Uh, and yes, the Darien police will respond. They responded on May 31st, 1981, and the officer was shot during a burglary. It's a real uh, risk. This will become a target if it's open all night. And I, I would make one other observation. Right now, we have two very well-developed rest areas on the turnpike that are well lit. Uh, they're busy. 24-7, they are yes. less likely to be a target because of the activity overnight, much less than they were 20, 30 years ago, which leaves gas stations like this and convenience stores right alongside the highway to become the next uh, the next target. So yes, it is a uh, definitely a health and safety issue and the commission Great. should uh, consider that. Great. I would like to uh, just hold off on uh, any more of our traffic comments because uh, the, Mike is still working on his review and um, I'd like to take a look at that. And if there's any final thoughts we have on it, we'll come back next month or next. You're more than welcome to, not a problem. Um, Carrie, you want to say something? Yeah, there's something that Attorney Maslin just said that actually resonated and raised an issue for me, which was the, your point about the well-laid, more heavily trafficked and more constant like presence of people on the I-95 and Merritt, you know, Parkway rest stops areas. And those are also serviced by the Connecticut State Police. And in fact, there's a state police barracks very close by and they don't service the post road. So doesn't that make this site an even more attractive potential location given that it's outside of state trooper normal jurisdiction. I think there are certain um, situations where obviously they're going to respond, but less trafficked, state troopers are not normally going to be there. There won't be private security as a current anticipated you know plan doesn't that really make it a greater target and i'm just asking and you may not know the answer to that but the things you said and the other public um speakers spoke about that really just seems to stick out in my mind i would i would agree with that um i don't know where the troopers are eating now but those rest areas are much more attractive to them than they Why? were to me 35 40 years ago oh, are you a state trooper <laughs> like Right, but the state troopers have jurisdiction on 95, not, you know, and they have the rest stop on, you know, down in Greenwich where, you know, they're the way station. 
And so they're more common, you know, you don't see state troopers driving through Darien often. You see Darien police officers driving through Darien, not state troopers. Correct. What you'll typically see is a, a trooper going through the rest areas on the turnpike and the parkway just to ride through and, and you know, as part of the patrol. They may eat there. They may go to a local uh, restaurant um, in, in town here, uh, pick up a sandwich or whatever, but that's just, you know, long enough to stop and eat. It's not part of their regular patrol. Consider, right, the addition of more people you know, just more traffic and the addition of state troopers as opposed and and local police as opposed to this location, which would have less traffic, no state trooper presence, you know, to to think about. I mean, it just makes it seem more it'd be more of a target for crime. I, I, I agree. Okay. Kara, uh, we did ask the police department to submit a, a letter relative to safety and whatnot in their opinion um and also do a yeah. research of accident reports like we did with trader joe's but accident uh, reports kind of something different right like accident reports more it, accident. it's right it's two, it's two separate issues it's 100 two separate issues but you know the darian cops now sit inside at night they sit inside um one of them i know sits at home school another one sits over at the boy scout building maybe these guys sit at this building at midnight That's their job. Yeah. Your job is not to sit at private businesses. That should be the business paying for that, not the town. They, they sit inside. They sit inside. Right? Oh, yeah. the lead, providing security at a school. Let's, let's see what they say. Let's, let's see what the police department says. Okay. I could tell. I could talk for an hour about that, but I'm not going. To. Oh, I know you can. I know you can, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. We'll be back. I'm always on. Um, Fred, anybody else would, would like to speak at this point? We have no one else, Steve. Okay, um, just keeping it open. For, would anybody else, maybe some people didn't know how to go into the queue, would anybody else in the general public like to speak to this application? If you do, you can either turn on your microphone or your screen or letter. whatnot, or you can submit a letter or email to the commission. If not, it's okay. Um, most, of the, most of the remaining people that haven't spoken are somehow affiliated with 7-Eleven. Got it. Okay. There's a lot of people out here and, uh, you know, I see there's 24 people available. Amy, what we typically do is um, you're, you're more than welcome to address, to, um, address anybody from the public's comments. Yeah. Um, you can do that now. You can do it next go around. Yeah. Uh, so I think there are a couple of things that I think are important to address now. And then a couple that obviously um, I think we need to have um, some follow up with our, with our technical team. But I think certainly with, with on, that, this, with, on this last with that, um, with that being said, Jane, I don't mean to interrupt. I apologize. Yeah, yeah, just a couple of minutes because it's now 1020. Um, yeah, we got a couple yeah. other and, things and to we do. Thought we had an hour. Yes, I, yeah. I'm well aware. Um, so, and I will be brief on those two comments. So, I think one, um, you, this is a gas station. To the parade of horribles that um, have been presented to this commission by a number of the public speakers. Clearly, there are gas stations that are operating in Darien, and while there might be the occasional um, robbery or something else, they are functioning. They are not the targets and need to have police sitting at them. And I don't think that the, the fact that this facility will be open 24 hours um, will have anything to do with that. Clearly, these are, um, you know, it's a use and it serves a community benefit, um, you know, by being open 24 hours. And, and those stations are, you know, are functional and, and operate. Um, and then the second point, and I, I think we will do some follow-up just to answer those questions with respect to um, if there's any sort of growing, um, you know, literature or practice in, in the traffic universe about apps and those sorts of things. Um, but I do think there's there's no different, um, no difference between the 7-Eleven app and what's happening at um, you know, Starbucks or any other restaurant use or frankly, Whole Foods or any of the other facilities um, that have developed and really highlighted their app uh, system over the last, particularly over the last few months. Um, and I think it's frankly unfair to target 7-Eleven when um, there's also an app called Gas Buddy. I don't know if anybody else uses it. I have it on my phone. 
um, but it is what you can use um, for all of these private stations where you can go in, you put in the Darien zip code or wherever you happen to be, and you can search for whatever the lowest price gas is, and you may have um, this app directing traffic to a particular station. So that's certainly out there for um, that type of, uh, of use. The but other one I would ask if you look at the apps, if you want to just take a look at Shake Shack and see if they're a traffic generator, that's a national company, international company. That's in Darien now. Yep. I think Starbucks. I think if she, you know, it's it's not saying it's unfair to like consider your app because, like you pointed out, Starbucks and Shake Shack, other places in town have an app. And I think what we've all noticed is with use of the app, sometimes it makes people be there less. But given the number and the variety of usage at your location, right? You're not in there. <laughs> with one usage, you're not a Shake Shack with one usage. You are a convenience store, restaurant, gas station. So three usages with an app, the intensity increase with the app, I think makes you distinguishable from Starbucks and Shake Shack. So it's not unfair to consider your app in terms of intensity and traffic. And that's wholly and, you know, necessary within our remit and so it's not unfair to your to your client it's actually reasonable on our behalf to consider that given the types and the variety of usage you're asking for and the app and the location so we're not treating your client unfairly or differently than starbucks or shake shack starbucks and shake shack have one primary use your client has multiple and the app intensifies in already application that it, that will intensify usage okay. that, and, and we don't we don't know that to be true we don't know that um frankly it may it may no, simply no, it use it more more than one purpose well we we have our application pro proposes the gas station as the principal use to, to attorney mm -hmm. mass's question and mm -hmm. then the food and retail as accessory use that's not to say, like I said, you can, you can also go to Whole Foods and buy not only your groceries, but coffee. So there's- but look, at the, but look at the parking that Whole Foods has versus you. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the beginning of that. The parking difference between Whole Foods and you. And, and, and that's, that's being I mean, parked as retail. We're parking for each of these unfair. uses. My point was you said it was unfair to consider the app usage for your client and not consider it for Starbucks and Shake Shack. I said, I didn't say unfair. I said that we were no different than those facilities that were also, that were also using apps. But I think- but you have more use of than they don't. I'm okay. sorry, you cut off again, but- You have more than one use. You're a gas station, a convenience store, a grocery store, a convenience store, right? And they're primarily retail. Their accessory, but we can we can agree to disagree about how those are how those are characterized. But um, so I think with that uh, we will follow up on the you know the technical piece um, with respect to um, you know some of the the traffic considerations and um, you know I think there were a couple of other uh, legal comments that that Mr. Madlin had commented and uh, we'll we'll plan to address those at a at a subsequent meeting. Okay, so I, sorry, I think it was real quick. Sorry, my name is Cal Ahmad. Just want to chime in on uh, mm -hmm. something that the attorney for 7-Eleven just brought up about the hours. Uh, oh, she sir, said, sir, sir, yes. Can you just state your name. I mean, we stopped public comment, but are you part of the applicant? Are you public? Uh, my name is Cal Ahmad. I own uh, Smart Foods of Darien. It's the mobile gas station, 211 Post Road. All right, so we're gonna go back to public comment for a second. Yes, just, it'll take 20 seconds, just real quick. Uh, when she okay. said serving the community for the 24 hours, if anybody knows Darien, it is a ghost town after 9 p.m. So it's not serving the community, it's serving I-95 travelers going north and south, it's serving Norwalk, possibly, but it's not serving Darien. That's what I know from my years of experience being there. Um, and that's what they're aiming for, positioning of the location. Everything is positioned for it to be a super pumper for its 
proximity to the highway and for its brand name it's going to be it's a magnet for traffic from everything from the app to the brand loyalists who just love everything about it so it's not your normal mom and pop location this is going to be a super pumper and they're going for 24 hours a day which is people coming off 95 in and out if that's that's their target market so, it's an Sonoco across the street till 10 o'clock and the mobile across the street until 11 o'clock. Correct. And Vernal down the block is up to 10 o'clock. Yes. And the other gentleman that works at Exxon at 1358 Post Road until 11 o'clock. Got it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. So, just one very quick comment. Um, obviously, Mr. Mod Station is almost in exactly the same position. So I think the the concern about the competitive nature of people getting off 95 and getting gas is obvious. And I will tell you, um, if this was a, a meeting in person, Mr. Maslin could possibly need to get gas on his way home at um, almost 11 o'clock at night. I've been in that situation, and um, I don't think this is just intended to serve um, transient traffic or, you know, you forget somebody, you have a sick child at two o'clock in the morning and you ran out of ibuprofen. It'd be nice to have somewhere to go get it. So um, there is that opportunity. So with that, um, Mr. Chairman, if there's anything else, um, we can address it. You know, we'll obviously the focus being traffic on the um, November 11th meeting. Um, November and 10th, the November 10th. I, sorry, I said, That's I keep saying okay. it backwards. <laughs> yeah, November 10th meeting, I have it I have written down correctly. Thank you. So you have some homework. We have some homework. We have to get Michael Galante's thing done. Your engineer and Joe Canis are going to trade um, emails back and forth and get on the same page. Mm -hmm. um, and then the signage, you're trying to button down your signage um, so we can see that um, eventually. Um, and when a, 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 who's looking at that? That's ZBA. Oh, right? We have a number of issues here. As Amy's continuing to work with ZBA and ARB as well. Fantastic. But Great. Tuesday, November 10th, 8 p.m., it'll be online again. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. This hearing we'll now. continue the hearing till then. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Um, next time on our, on our um, deliberations or our meeting, that's the end of the public hearing, folks. Now we go into the general meeting, time permitting. What time is it? It is 10 29. Um, <laughs> We have three resolutions. Three draft resolutions, yeah. Three different uh, commissioners. It, it, it does say time permitting, and we also have the um, subcommittee report we want to follow up on. Um, so somebody pull me. We want to get through the three draft resolutions, right? What am I going to do with this? Right, we have the after school program. Can you tell me what, these three? One, two, three. Yeah, one, two, and the revised third. So one is uh, the shed for the fire department, uh, which was a pretty straight public hearing. The other was the after school programs at the schools, which uh, special permit. And the third was for uh, to allow basement, attic, prep areas, or prep area in the basement, attic office, 171 post road. So we've got three draft resolutions in the town. And that's the diner directly across the street, up the block from this property by Mr. Maslow. Um, all right, so let's just do these three. We'll get through these things and then we'll talk about deliberations only. And I, I, I really want to get to the subcommittee report if you guys don't mind. That's pretty important to me. And I'd like to be done, you know, before quarter to 11. Um, any objection? Yes, no, maybe so. Okay, Paige. All right. Um, hey next time. So tired. You're tired. You're right, Jen. Yeah, let's do this. Special permit application number 316, Deer and After School LLC, 10 Near Water Lane, um, 18 Hoyt Street, 395 and 133 Manson Road and 7 Old Farm Road. Okay, this is the, um, the Haley Marcocus to put in preschool and after school programs at our five elementary schools. Um, resolution basically approved as submitted. In essence, um, did anybody find any um, typos, Scribner's errors, questions that jumped out? I did not. That's your job, George. 
Uh, program hours 7 30 a.m to 6 50 p.m it was open really it only it only starts at 7 8, 7 30 a.m that's what they put in the application wow i thought you'd like to drop off kids on the play not anymore now that time's changed wow. now with covid out of school over here carry up program i didn't see anything dumped off the page to me i think you know, Jeremy and Fred did a great job. Yep. That said, looking for a mo motion to approve as submitted, uh, given by Jennifer, seconded by Jim Rand. All in favor? Eyeball? Aye. Aye. Thank Six you. Zero. Six nothing. One down. Yankees didn't win. We just hold our hands up for each one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, that makes it easier. Fire department. <laughs> Site plan application number 186E is at Edward, Darren Fire Department, 848 Boston Post Road. These are the fire guys who want to put a shed in their backyard and take up a parking space. And I think this is one of the shortest ones I've ever seen. Three pages? Come on. Great. Ooh, I got any questions, comments? Ooh, all right. I'm going faster. Uh, no scrimmage there. Je Jennifer proposed or uh, amended, what do we call them? In motion, Jim Rand seconded. All in favor? Karen, all that to me. There you go. Six nothing. Okay. There you go. Next, the next one is we put a revised resolution sent out by email today, which changed a couple of things that were in the packet. You guys can hear what Jeremy's saying, right? Ken, yeah. I, I got the amendment. It wasn't redlined, so it's really hard when it's not redlined to, to like. Uh, mine's red line. Oh, mine the uh, left margin has a red line. Oh, I maybe could, if I read it my, reading on my phone, it didn't come through that way. So if you could just highlight what was changed. Okay, Jeremy or Fred, want to just tell us what was changed from the original draft to the new draft? To me, it's it's paragraph four. It's the whole thing is in in super red. Right, we put in. I think it was related to, uh, as I recall, Fred. It related to the attic and basement, but we wanted to reaffirm that this is not cooking in the attic or basement. This is reheating and it's not cooking. And if they want, because the prior approvals for this never allowed cooking in the attic or the basement, it only allowed cooking in the kitchen. So this is- It also went to the issue of stories. How many stories there were? Thank you address that issue, George, thank you. Yeah. It, it was found to be what two and a half by ZBA, or ZBA didn't touch it and left it to us to worry about. That's correct. And he would like, I think this provides that it's two and a half stories, and they'd have to come back if they want to use any more of either the attic or the basement. But That's exactly you, right. Basement for cooking? You no, know, basement for prep. That's the, the the story was you know you're gonna get a bunch of heads of lettuce and you're gonna break them up and wash them in the basement. You're going to take them upstairs and make the chefs out. That's exactly what they're doing. They're not. That type of, they're not. They're right. You just prep. 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 Yeah. Let's prep down there. This is enforceable. I mean, it is. No, I agree, Karen. It's difficult to enforce. It is very difficult. The health department goes to these things all the time. We use them A, B, C's, and D. Yeah, but would this be part of the health department's remit? If the health department goes down there and, is, and oh, wait, they're making. Wait. My question is, if right, their their remit works around health department regulations, not whether planning and zoning says you can reheat versus cook. So I don't think goes to the equipment down there. There's no grill down there, for example. Um, so it's it's certainly we're trying to be as specific as possible while granting the applicant the equipment. So you say they can reheat. So to reheat, there has to be something down there. There is something to reheat, yes. So what's that? There's a, I think there was on the plan that they submitted. Uh, Gotta be a refrigerator. Part of the record. There's, for example, ice makers down in the basement. An ice maker doesn't reheat. We're talking. There are. Uh, little warming ovens in the basement. There's prep tape, three prep tables, uh, a fridge. That was in the uh, application. I see that. Yeah. 
toppings of France. Warming ovens, not not cooking. Warming ovens can get up to like. It, it is. I agree. It's a fine line. Where's the warming oven? Our yeah. does not enforce that. It's like same prep table, same same prep table. Two warming ovens. It's on the second page. Oh, that's it. Just no, that's next, page. next page. You see Bring your friend zoning ID and you get a free meal if you go down to the basement and make sure it's what? I'm just trying to I mean, what <laughs> why are we changing it? Like reheating versus cooking. Is it is it about the three and a half to like I see if, warming. If it can't cook down there, then that's not usage of more than two and a half stories. <sighs> now the three and a half stories got to do with the attic. Okay, so what's the deal with the why? Why we make this change for the basement? We care about the ovens. They have to cook roast beef down there. No, they don't serve her. <laughs> no. What about turkey? Warming. I mean, yeah. everyone just, I just don't, I'm just trying to understand a change. Uh, is this, is this new paragraph say warming oven? Yes. Page two. But I think they covered it. Yeah, it says it any part that includes heating. There's sinks, prep tables, ice, ice, ice yeah. It's the nice victory fridge. I, I don't see anything that includes heating in their Is plan. The uh, Wait, so I'm looking at the wrong version. Go to page, um, page two page of the A10, A9. A, A10, go to A10 in this thing, page fire. That's for the attic. Uh, no, that's, I think that's the basement. Um, no, it's the attic. Attic. I think the attic is, I think the attic is A10. A10 is the attic. A8, 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 they didn't so that's what we're just trying to regulate. Maybe they put, you know, you know, Christmas pies down there. I, you know, I don't know. Why did we make the change? You mean who requested it? I'm just trying to understand the change because we're. It, it seems to make it more specific, and I'm trying to understand. Did, did Jeremy and Fred want to do belts and suspenders? Make it stick out further. Why? That was the other. The, was the, other. the commission is approving a very specific use in a, a very specific limited use in the both the basement and the attic, and the change here is highlighting that fact. Um, <clears throat> and if the applicant chooses to expand their operations in any manner. Uh, in the future, whether they wish to expand the square footage in either the basement or the attic, or conduct additional uh, cooking activities within these, uh, particularly within the basement, they would need to come back to the commission for uh, prior approval to to, uh, to to moving forward with that. I got yeah, I got one hundred percent. He's just making it more specific. He's he made it specific, exactly what they asked for. So, if you compare do. pages eight, a eight and a nine, I think you'll see the ovens are existing, and they simply are excluded from a nine because they're already there. Yeah, I mean a nine to me looks like it's more um, blown up. It's more uh, blown up, right? But I'm very good that. I don't know if the ovens are there or not, but. It, that's that's the, his only change to it was because they want to make it super specific, and I think that's a good thing. All right. I move the approval of that um, resolution. That's uh, submitted. Looking for a second. Jim Rand's a second. All in favor? Six nothing. Done. All right. Um, I would. It's now ten uh, uh, forty. Right. What time it is? Think so. Yeah. Um, I would like to adjust the agenda and, and punt the deliberations only on the two items. Also punt 
on the three items and go right to the subcommittee report. Do we need to address the agenda on that? No, just skip right over them. Okay, we're we'll skipping right over them. Um, subcommittee, you have a spot on the agenda to speak your update to us. As part of the subcommittee report, though, I did have Fred or um, Fred or Jeremy email you guys something I put together. Um, I don't know if you eyeballed it or didn't eyeball it. I apologize, it's my fault for being late. But um, this is, it's kind of an offshoot of what these guys are working on. So subcommittee, take it away. Yeah, I, I did see that, uh, Steve. I, th I think what we're envisioning and what, so I'll just let you know what we've done. Um, we're putting together a document, a very, we're trying to make it a crisp, it's gonna be a two, oh, I'd love to make it a one pager, it'll be a two pager document that basically states our position um walks through the desegregate connecticut um what are their their 10 objectives gives the position that we feel on those on those objectives and we spent some time we spent a lot of time going through each one of them and talking in detail um highlighting some of the exact proposals that have been in previous bills and the, the basic overall thrust of the document is we believe very strongly that um, all decision-making should be local. And that while there might be some honorable goals being presented by some of these legislations, the fact is once it's one size fits all, it just will not work for Darianne. And we've got, we're, so really what we've been doing is taking that skeleton framework and populating it with data. Uh, Jeremy did a really good job on providing something on, I think it was Friday slash Saturday that I incorporated into the document this morning. We got together this morning, went through it one more time. I've got some homework, some wordsmithing to do on it to just, um, I'm sure. um, you know, just 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 tighten it a little bit. But other than that, I think we're there. I mean, I think I think right after that, we've got something that we can share. And then the it, what, what we envision is that there'll be some appendix, appendices. Uh, there's a very good map that was created showing what part of Darien is in fact within a half mile of a transit station, within a quarter mile of um, you know high density business districts. It's a third of the town, um, and at that point we can. You know, I can I can email it around, and we can just I, I believe just you know work via email and say you know and, and approve as a commission, and then at that point you, you release it or however you want me to, to communicate it, turn it into a letter to our our uh, legislative leaders, as I think what you originally envisioned. I don't know if that's still the the thought process. But, that's uh, my thought. That's my thought process. Yeah. The, um, um, it, well, is it? At the end of the day, well, this is what I'm trying to, to to keep the ball moving forward. If you guys are basically done with it, is it something we can quote unquote um, you see in advance and vote on a final, you know, you know, draft with you know some edits on something like the tenth? We'd say this is it, and then after that, we said this is the body. You know, then we can put a draft to oh, it. Oh, yeah, easily by the tenth. I, I it could even be earlier. But our next meeting's not until the tenth. That's, right, well, um, that's why I suggested an email format where we can do it off meeting. Agreed. That would put be great. Yeah. Put it on the agenda for 10 to review and approve like the subcommittee's submission, just like we just did the, the three resolutions. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, maybe George in his legal mind wants to put a word smithing in or something like that. Maybe I picked up something, but I changed the word, you know, here, there. Or yeah. That's all. Well, Kara's on the committee, isn't Kara on the committee? Um, no, no I mean, we've got no lawyers, so this is a document. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's that way, actually. In English, you know. <laughs> don't let Jim Red, don't let Jim Red fool you, though. He's he's got a lot of good lawyers. Just play one on TV. That's all. Yeah. The, the only well, thing I, I do, you know, I mean, it, it's obviously a serious question, George, but uh, I think we're part of what we're we're coming from since these proposals don't actually exist today is I think we have a little flexibility to talk about things that have been proposed 
and then without having to get into the fine minutia of you know jim has pointed out in a couple of the bills where where, th where things where, where, where concepts such as home rule might apply or you know does a half mile from a transit uh center includes stay within or without the municipality so does the glenbrook st station in stanford extend into darien or the rowayton station you know extend on raymond street and exactly. you can look at the doc at look at the proposals and, and and maybe go both ways i think okay. the perspective is since the this is something that's going to be proposed in january allows us to say hey these are all things on the table right and if we want to make sure that they're properly discussed we need to raise anything that might be an issue even if the fine print of the legislation says well you know technically under home rule you don't really have to worry about that you know it, in which case then why do we need to fight back and litigate if we needed to to, to assert that and and Kara right. wants to come back. i so i was on a call um, uh, with at Westcock, you know, with Westcock members on the Planning and Zoning Subcommittee, and they had a lot of really bright and knowledgeable people on the line, like way beyond even what I kind of knew about. But um, what they spoke about, some of these experts, and I can give you the notes, is that much of what's in there. It's sort of against even there's unintended consequences beyond even the home rule stuff we're talking about, which is, you know, environmental concerns and um, urban, you know, sprawl issues, which is kind of like against what urban and city planners kind of it's like sort of the crux of, you know, what they think about in terms of, you know, what's in sort of urban and city planning and regional planning and so i think some of the, i'll get you the guy there was this guy who was on the call who you know i think has been in the you know in urban and regional planning for 40 years or actually i think he was in the 70s way more than that and you know worked for the u.s postal service and the connecticut legislature no the guy was like incredibly knowledgeable you no know, and he could name every statute and every regulation in every town in Connecticut. He could name mm -hmm. out of the 169 towns, 147 do X, Y, Z, 143 do accessory dwelling units. This guy, his knowledge base, and he's completely nonpartisan. He was so impressive and um, he is completely just like this legislation makes absolutely no sense. And oh, that's for, great. So that's why, yeah, I mean, that's why we're I, chiming I, in. I, and maybe we could put, so so we're basically saying the same thing without the knowledge. Right. I think yeah. this document, if I were to characterize yeah. it as anything, saying, it's I'll a conversation this. starter. Yeah. Right. But I, think, sorry, I can give you this guy's name as a resource. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I mean, this guy, I can't even tell you how impressed I was with him. Um, his knowledge base is uh, insurmountable. And he has a private database he's kept himself <laughs> since. <laughs> right, but that's, that's my funnel system again, Kara. That's where the three goes to six, goes to the town, goes to the seven groups, and then goes to Westcott. That's We're dead on square. Yeah. I, he was just incredibly knowledgeable and um, understood these issues and like the unintended consequences or collateral consequences on both environmental, urban sprawl, transportation, like his knowledge base on what the consequences of, of some of the things in the you know, particularities in the regs could lead to. I mean, he, was extensive and um he's been a supreme expert witness in the supreme court on land use issues multiple times like this guy you know he knew he was like it, to say an expert is an understatement right i'll give you his name everybody yeah i'm super well, impressive maybe we can pick up a few nuggets let me go mm -hmm. in there you go george May I just quickly, I, I know I, I uh, gave up my opportunity to participate in this, so I, I shouldn't um, micromanage it all, and I don't mean to, but I just want to go to Larry's first point. 
which was this is all about local control. And I do encourage you in your letter to address that head on, to address Tim Hollister's comment that local control is absurd and that if we were creating the constitution of the state again, there would be no way that the state would relegate to each of the 169 municipalities the land use authority. So we should go right at that somehow and, and talk about our proud uh, history and, and uh, how it's a, you know, it hasn't resulted in uh, a Levitt town here that, you know, and yeah. a town like Marianne or many others. So, I mean, I just, you know, I mean, until, until this is ready for all of you to, to see, I don't want to put it out in our public forum yet, but that's, that. Cool. Okay. Very much on the, we, we are a very like mind. Thank you. That, that's okay. fantastic. Great. Yeah. Because if you release something on the 10th, then you know, it's well. Actually, if you release something over email um, to the six of us, that public forum anyway. Correct. So as right. soon as you send it out to all six of us, or you send the Jeremy Jeremy sends to us, that makes it public. Um, Correct. But yeah, well, that's why I'm, we're I'm just kind of tighten it up a little more than it's public. Yeah, we're not we're not hiding anything. You know, no, 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 it's, no, 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 it's no. transparent. Yeah. Um, so if if if, it, if it's in a form, if if it goes back and forth via email, which is a great idea. And it's in a form that we can all quote unquote approve it and sign off on it in the form that it's in is a memo form i guess um on the 10th and then all we have to do is convert it to a letter um if we're going to send it off to our people if that's what we want to do um that's great i mean i do i don't want to take my off the ball of doing a public hearing on this thing it was jennifer's idea way back when i think it's a fantastic idea to do a public hearing on it because it went from three the sixth, if we all approve it on the tenth, and then we can go public hearing after the tenth. I just want to make sure we spot on the calendar. Um, so that's you know, if we're ready to go, we're ready to go, and, and you know, we, we can do the public hearing before or after we send it to the to the mm -hmm. people. And remember, we're not, we're not we're not following the first elections in office at all. We can run on parallel tracks. We don't have to list. They can do whatever they want. We can do whatever we want. You know, it's going to end up on our thing, so we can send a letter out. If they match, if they match the first elections office, you know, all their goals, great. If they don't match, that's okay too. You know, um, so you square, Larry. Because I just need another three minutes just, of everybody. Just remember, time. those emails are FOIable. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, no, 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 I, no, no, absolutely. That's uh, in fact, I've, I've actually, my, my town email is having an issue right now, so I've made sure that I'm just included ncc because every all, all that needs to be in the record um the only I'm having a problem the, the, but I'm, so no 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 yeah very clear to make way, sure everything is there the way we've historically handled it if 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 you send it to jeremy jeremy or the the, the planning zone sends it to us if the six commissioners send comments back to jeremy then jeremy gets them all and then sends it to whoever is the author with the pen instead yeah. of i mean know, i mean there's nothing, there's nothing in here that we are you know there's not this is all very very straightforward very agreed. very fair agreed it's just we're just we're just making it readable right um, and and the only relative to that one point and, I, and i'm sure you guys did a great job and i'm sure there's probably not going to be a huge amount of comments i just go back to what ridgefield said they went through their draft document you know six drafts it took them a long time to get it done once they started putting pencil of paper so if you did it this way, you know, you're doing it on, you know, lightning speed, if it takes two drafts. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, applaud right. you for that. Um, are you square? Okay, then the only thing I wanna do is just indulge you for, for another three minutes and I swear I'll keep it short. The chart that, and if you have seen or have not seen it yet, um, I did a matrix of, um, our seven peer group towns and the people that I've been talking to on these meetings. The next meeting, I think that they call it the Council of Chairs, whatever these people call it. Um, the next meeting we're supposed to have is on the 11th. In, in a bunch of meetings that I've been to and, and I've listened to Jamie and I've said it, you know, the word is that we do 90% of the stuff that the town does. Some the other towns do a different 90%, some towns only do 10. So at the suggestion of the first selection, I did this matrix. Um, it's very raw, and I did it in, um, in Excel form. What I would like to do 
I already said it to Jamie Stevenson. I said it to the woman that was on our meeting last week from Ridgefield. And I said, this is what I want to try to figure out. Not, no, sorry, you're right, not Ridgefield from Greenwich. Mm -hmm. um, I said, I'm just trying to figure out where we stand. If we already do 99% of these things and we're missing one, you know, that takes an issue. If some of the towns are missing a lot, it takes it. So it's kind of just a matrix for a scorecard to see why the state wants to, you know, why we have to secede local control to the state if we're already doing them anyway, right? So that's why I want to send it to you. I think it's a great tool because um, I did it. It wasn't necessarily my idea, but because I did it, um, you know, it's it's so I just want you guys to see it. Um, if anybody has any questions, comments, changes, Fred now it's in, in it's in Fred's court. Um, so he's now the the he's got the current version. I added something today about daycare. Um, the other documents behind are these things. This is taking everybody's population and size from one central source. So not someone's not taking their man size from a different source, a different, it's all one central spot. On here, you're gonna see a thing that says meeting single family home price for the last 12 months of um, 2Q 2020. That's off of like a Douglas Elliman or a um, or a Coldwell Banker listing sheet where it's all from one same source. And it's the mill rates is all one same source. What I'm just trying to figure out is, is is where Darien sits. It's more expensive to live in Rowayton than it is to live in Darien. You know, I was kind of shocked about that. We had mortgage and taxes together. It's I was like, really? I didn't know that. You know, so they pick on certain towns. Um, then the other, other item I put on here is, you know, who's your attorney? You know, well, these other towns, you guys got the same attorney as us, different attorneys. Do you like your attorney, not like your attorney? Um, so if you look at that, if everyone says great. I want to send it. If someone says, you know, I want to change this and this, I'll pull it back. Yes, Kara. All right. On that point, this brilliant, very knowledgeable guy who spoke, he also um, has the, you know, on his database that he has kept himself personally since 19, I think, 73 or four, on every municipality in Connecticut and where they are and their rent changes and what they do. He actually stated a number of times clearly that um, Fairfield County and Southwestern Fairfield County specifically has led the state of Connecticut in many of the, you know, changes and, you know, movements towards, you know, being more, you know, we say inclusive now, you know, back in 1980 or back in 1960, those words were not used. It was different terminology, but he was speaking about in terms of changes to regulation, changes to zoning, changes to practices, and doing actual steps towards the goals that they're talking about. He said, in fact, in the state of Connecticut, South Fairfield County and Southwestern Fairfield County has led the state in these changes and so that was part of his thing like he's not a partisan guy so he was sitting there like i find this all confusing because the data says xyz and i know this for a fact you know so i think in doing that matrix it might be useful even to reach out to him and email him and just say you know we're looking to do this can we backstop or fact check our data analysis or our matrix against what you know you have and would you mind us citing you as a source and he may not want to be cited as a source i don't know um but um he seems to have a, a data and a a view based on data and based on evidence and that's what where his view came from and i think that's important it's more than like well, you know, a movie about a town that maybe Darian says Darian's like this. Well, okay, but you know, I get that when I'm on these calls, I get that all the time because you guys are in the forefront. We want to follow what you did. You know, send us your roadblock. Call John. He has data and evidence to support that. Yeah. And I don't no, need that's it. Fine. So, like, it's you not like that guy. I did. I, I was, was just. 
Just for the record, there was a call that I was supposed to be on, and I punted at the last minute because of my kids swim me. So I said, Carrie, you want to jump on this call? She loved me. So impressed. The guy is so impressed. Everyone <laughs> All right, is, I used my three minutes and Carol, Carol took us over. It's 11 right. one. that was not my fault. I did three minutes. So that's where we are. So if you guys can look at the matrix, any comments you have, you know, let Jeremy or Fred know. Um, if you hate it, don't let me know, okay? <laughs> um, I just wanna see where we all, okay? I'm just trying to make sure we're, you're, you know, we're towing the line. So with that said, I would entertain a motion to adjourn at 11 whatever time it is. Dan, you're, right, you're not allowed to vote. Motion to adjourn. Oh, Larry Warble. Here you go. Is there a second? Jennifer, all in favor. Eyeball. Thanks, sports fans.